distinguished panelists, members of the Nigerian Gas Association, ladies and gentlemen. It's one o'clock. Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar hosted by the Nigerian Gas Association. The theme for this webinar is the Nigerian Gas Transportation Network Code, highlights, potentials, challenges, and domestic market readiness. I'm just taking a look at the participant list. We have um, a lot of participants still joining. So we'll just give them about two to three minutes to join the event. The participants are still flooding in. We have uh, almost 200 attendees thus far. So I will just give another two minutes to allow people to register. Yes, please start. Thank you. Distinguished panelists, members of the Nigerian Gas Association, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar hosted by the Nigerian Gas Association. The theme for this webinar is the Nigerian Gas Transportation Network Code, highlights, potentials, challenges, and domestic market readiness. Thank you for taking the time out to join us. Please be aware that this event is being recorded. My name is Taji Ogwe, Executive Secretary of the Nigerian Gas Association. The Nigerian Gas Transportation Network Code is a contractual framework between the gas transportation network operator, gas shippers, and other defined entities that specifies the terms and guidelines for operation and use of the gas network. It is expected that the code will provide open and competitive access the gas transportation infrastructure and catalyze development of the Nigerian gas sector, thereby stimulating domestic utilization and gas-based industrialization. Since the launch of the code by the Honorable Minister of State for Petroleum Resources in February 2020, 
Industry has been waited, waiting with bated breath for details on how the code will be operationalized and the likely impacts on industry players. The NGI has taken a proactive approach to engage with the Department of Petroleum Resources, DPR, and industry in order to facilitate industry-wide consultation, dialogue, clarification, and buy-in. This webinar aims to converge industry thought leadership to shape the direction of the operationalization process by interrogating the current status, progress gaps, and roadmap to successful implementation of the code. The theme of this webinar, once again, is Nigerian Gas Transportation Network Code highlights potentials, challenges, and domestic market readiness. Before we go further, some ground and house rules. For the panelists, please mute your microphone when you're not speaking and remember to unmute your microphone when invited to speak. For our attendees, there are two methods of communication, the chat function and the Q&A function. Please use the chat function to communicate with, communicate with other participants or make general comments. To activate the chat function, simply click on the chat icon in your user interface. Kindly use the Q&A function. Q&A here means question and answer. For your questions and for your questions only, please, please, please do not paste comments in the Q&A box. And when crafting your questions, kindly indicate who the question is directed at. To activate the Q&A function, simply click on the Q&A icon in your user interface. I'm sure that many attendees will have a lot of questions as the webinar progresses. Bear with us because of time constraints, we will not be able to treat most of your questions, but rest assured that all questions that are entered into the Q&A box, as well as those received during the registration process, will be compiled and answered after the webinar and answers will be sent to all attendees in due course. During the question and answer session, polls will, will be deployed. Each of these polls will ask a topical question. When the poll appears on your screen, simply click to answer. It would also interest you to know that this event is being streamed on YouTube and recorded for those that are unable to log into the platform due to technical or capacity reasons. The YouTube link will be regularly posted in the chat arena for your information. Kindly share this link, this link with your network so they can join as well. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, permit me to introduce the members of this illustrious panel to you. Our keynote speaker is Mr. Steve Zaka Ayuba. Steve Ayuba is an assistant director in the Department of Petroleum Resources, the leading regulatory agency of the oil and gas industry in Nigeria. Domestic market performance is being promoted by the DPR through sustainable gas supply, enhanced growth of the domestic gas market, and positively influencing gas market investment in Nigeria. With over 25 years industry experience, Steve leads the domestic gas utilization unit in the gas division of the DPR, and is mainly responsible for coordinating regulatory activities required for deepening the performance of the domestic gas value chain in Nigeria. Mr. Steve Ayuba, you're welcome, sir. Our lead speaker is Mr. Peter Cameron. Peter is founder and managing director of Energy Markets Global, a UK-based international consultancy in energy markets, particularly gas. He's also lecturer in business strategy for the UK-based Middlesex University Oil and Gas MBA. With over 25 years industry experience, including long-term assignments in Nigeria, Argentina, Colombia, Central Asia, Ukraine, and the UK, Peter has considerable experience in network codes, having drafted the original network code for Ukraine and being involved in the development of the UK network code. Mr. Peter Cameron, you're welcome, sir. Our next panelist is Mrs. Mary Rose Richard Obioha. Mary Rose is currently the general manager commercial of the Nigerian Gas Company Limited, Prior to her redeployment to NGC, she served in various capacities. The most recent was the general manager, New Energy Ventures, where she coordinated the assessment and development of new energy business. She also worked as manager risk planning and business development in the seven critical gas development projects, manager NMPC sole risk team, manager project interface and pipeline security. She was also involved in the construction of LMA petrochemical uh, complex for Harcourt River State. Mrs. Mary Rose Richard Obioha, you're welcome, ma'am. Our next panelist is Mr. James Odiase. James is an independent oil and gas consultant with about 30 years industry experience, acquired in various roles in Nigeria, 
and the Netherlands with Royal Dutch Shell, and more recently with Seven Energy, Savannah Energy Group. He is a recognized subject matter and industry expert on gas and power commercial transactions and regulations. He is currently the chairman of the NGA study group on gas network code and infrastructure. Mr. James Odiasi, you're welcome, sir. Our next panelist is Mrs. Dolako Kukoi. Dolako is a partner at Detail Commercial Solicitors and leads the firm's power and gas to power practice. She is one of the leading lawyers in Nigeria's power sector with in depth knowledge on infrastructure and PPP projects. Dolako is particularly skilled at navigating regulatory hurdles and liaising with government counterparties and regulators on behalf of clients. Her transactional experience includes advising CBN and NERC on the Intervention Fund for the Nigeria Electricity Supply Industry. She is currently an ex officio on the Council of the NGA. Mrs. Dolako Kukwe, you are welcome, ma'am. Our next panelist is Mrs. Mufulusha O. Agbakuba. With over 22 years' experience in the audit, consulting, and oil and gas sectors, Mufulusha leads Chevron Nigeria Limited's gas commercial team and is responsible for maturing new opportunities, managing gas related commercial transactions and interests across the Nigerian and West African regional gas value chains. Mrs. Agbakuba, who was a member of the pioneering OPTS Network Code Subcommittee, holds a master's in finance from the prestigious London Business School. Mofolusha is the immediate past Deputy Secretary General of the Nigerian Gas Association. Mrs. Agbakuba, you're welcome, ma'am. Your moderator for today's event is Dr. David Ige. David is founder and CEO of Gas Invest Limited. He has over 23 years industry experience spanning both the private and public sector. He was previously GED Gas and Power in MPC, a petroleum engineer with Shell International Petroleum Company, Netherlands, Scotland, and Nigeria, and a strategy consultant with Accenture UK. He also served as advisor to the Honorable Minister of Petroleum and was the pioneer managing director of GACN. He was architect of the gas master plan and led its implementation. Dr. David Igay, you're welcome, sir. Your host for today's event is Mrs. Audrey Joezigo. With over 26 years experience, Audrey is the co-founder and deputy managing director of Falcon Corporation Limited. An accomplished professional, Audrey holds several master's degrees in finance, marketing, and business administration. Audrey is president of Nigerian Gas Association. She is the first female president of the NGA in the association's over 20 year history. A dedicated member of the NGA for over 13 years and prior to assuming the presidency, Audrey served for 11 of those years, years on the NGA Executive Council in various capacities. She was recognized as one of the leading ladies Africa 100 most inspiring women in Nigeria for 2019. Thank you for joining us, Mrs. Audrey Jones. My name is Taji Ogwe, Executive Secretary of the Nigerian Gas Association. I'll be the technical facilitator for today's event. Our agenda today is quite simple and straightforward. The president of the NGA will formally open the event. Thereafter, handing over to the moderator, the moderator will cue the presentations from the speakers and panelists in turn, followed by a discussion session, which will entertain questions and answers. This will be followed by Madam President's closing remarks. At this point in time, it is my great pleasure to invite my boss and mentor, the president, Nigerian Gas Association, Mrs. Audrey Joezipo, to make our opening remarks. Madam President. A very good afternoon to you all, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us in today's session. At this webinar, which is very aptly themed, the Nigerian Gas Transportation Network Code highlights potential challenges and domestic market readiness. It is not news that Nigeria has over 203.16 TCF of gas and another over 600 TCF of unproven reserves essentially making us more a gas nation than an oil nation. And one of the things that has been lacking in helping us to grow and develop our gas industry has been a transportation network code. Historically, there have been various attempts across different governments to bring this code to the fore, stemming from as far back as February 2003, when the Ministry of Petroleum Resources had commissioned some consultants to do some work around the code for Nigeria. Down into 2010, 
when the Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation had commissioned some UK-based consultants to try to develop a network code for Nigeria. And indeed, those consultants had delivered in March 2011 a draft code and the ancillary documents attendant to that. Indeed, as far as September 2013, this received parliamentary attention by the House of Reps. Regrettably, however, none of those attempts eventually led to the establishment of a functional network code for Nigeria. And this is very sad because for a country that has the kind of gas reserves that we do, and then having less than 10 miles per TCF of transportation infrastructure, it is definitely not an ideal situation and not one that would help us to deepen the breadth of the gas industry in Nigeria. Now, globally, gas associations tend to be an integral part of the development of gas regulations and network codes. And so as NGA, we certainly felt that in Nigeria, there would not be an exception, which is why, as the ES said in the introductory remarks, over the years, we have consistently advocated for the need to establish a national gas transportation network code. We have been very proactive very engaged with the Ministry of Petroleum Resources, the DPR, over the years, trying to make sure that there is a synergy between the regulators and the industry to establish a code that will be for the benefit of the nation. And having said that, I want to um, particularly acknowledge on behalf of the NGA, the leadership of the current, the immediate past and current leadership of the MPR and DPR in particular, who made for a much higher level of engagement with the NGA over the past few years that have culminated in the passage of the NGTNC in February by the Honorable Minister of State for Petroleum Resources, Chief Timmy Pre Silva. Now, like the NGA said, like the ES said, the industry has been waiting to see how this code will be operationalized, especially because the HM had mandated a six month period within which all gas transportation agreements existing must be migrated and brought into alignment with the provisions of the code. And also asking that any new GTAs would be executed in alignment with the code. And so the industry has received the launch of the code largely with optimism. We see it as, uh, as something that will accelerate the attraction of the much needed investments in the sector, something that would pro provide for a more competitive landscape, increase private sector play, especially in the midstream sector, and thereby further stimulating domestic gas utilization in Nigeria. What is clear for us as NGA, however, is that the launch of the code, while it was a big win in itself, is but the first of many wins that must necessarily happen for us to truly see the potential benefits of the code manifest in real terms. The one win, the next clear win that we so desperately desire and require as a nation is a successful operationalization of the code. And we know that the government is also looking at this because as I'm sure the DPR panelist and um, keynote speaker will speak to us about, they have also established a team to look at the operationalization of the code, to look at modalities for the successful migration of the existing GTAs onto the code and so on and so forth. So this is why as NGA, we felt that a conversation around the National Gas Transportation Network Code is very timely. And in our capacity as thought leaders and advocates for the growth, the development, the balancing and industrialization and prosperity of our nation, Nigeria, leveraging on our natural gas resources, that it was imperative for us to convene this webinar. I want to thank you once again for joining us today. At this point in time, I'm going to hand over to the moderator, Dr. David Ige, to take us through this session, to take us through the keynote spe um, speeches and the presentations by the very, um, erudite panelists, and then of course engage in addressing the questions that you may have as audience who are listening to us today. David is a gas man to the core. Indeed, as I see David, I always see gas master plan, gas infrastructure, blueprint, blueprints, network code. Uh, he has been on this journey for so long and there is no better person to take us through the conversations today. So thank you once again for joining. NGA continues to hold ourselves as that body that will do everything we can to facilitate the betterment of gas as an enabler of industrial development and economic growth in Nigeria. Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you all once again. Please have a very fruitful deliberation. Thank you very much. Yes, over to you. Thank you very much.
Madam President, the President of the Nigerian Gas Association. So without further ado, I would like to hand over to Dr. David again. Well, good afternoon all, and uh, thank you very much for having me. So it's indeed a pleasure to, to be sharing this moment with you all uh, today. Um, thank you, um, Mrs. Audrey, uh, for the introduction. Um, we have a very, very excellent mix of uh, panelists and speakers this afternoon. Uh, of course, the network code is a very topical subject, and uh, I am personally excited by the fact that at long last, just like uh, Madam President said, uh, we are getting to implement the, the network code. The, um, I'll just share with you very quickly um, just the journey, because the network code itself is not, in, is not an instrument in isolation. It's part of a long journey that had been uh, uh, that commenced in 2009 as part of the gas master plan. Uh, this slide shows you the journey from ground zero a couple of years back when the entire domestic market was uh, pretty much relatively immature, uh, just about 300 million cubic feet per day in 2009. There were no structures, no infrastructure beyond the Alps. Uh, the pricing was poor. As part of the gas master plan, uh, a whole set of interventions were put in place, uh, which were aimed at moving the domestic market towards what is step four, a fully liberalized and competitive gas market. And all sorts of interventions were there, each of which is mutually dependent on the other. As you can see in step two, the plan was that sometime in 2011, 2012, the network code would have been in implementation. It's intended to complement things like the, uh, the infrastructure development, the, uh, the pricing changes, uh, the domestic obligation, and a whole range of other interventions required to move the market towards full liberalization. So it's indeed a pleasure that, uh, although it's taken so long, uh, over 10 years to get to this point, uh, but the good thing is that we're getting there now. So you can see the network code is a very critical element in our journey towards a fully commercial and a fully liquid and ultimately a liberalized gas market. It's gonna address things around access, it's gonna address operational reliability and so on. So uh, I think that uh, we're in the right direction and uh, it's, it's good uh, uh, time for us now to, to spend this afternoon first to achieve a couple of things. The first one is uh, get a general perspective from the key actors, uh, which would be the DPR and NGC, as to the state of readiness of the market uh, for the implementation of the network code. But more importantly, is to get the perspectives of the other industry experts who are panelists today uh, to share their thoughts, uh, some of which may help us shape this journey as we go, uh, go forward there. So the network code, um, is basically a journey, not a destination right now. And so um, the idea is to get as much thoughts as possible uh, to help us shape this journey over the next few months in line with the directives of the Minister of Petroleum. So without saying much now, um, I would like to uh, introduce uh, uh, Peter Cameron, uh, sorry, uh, Steve Ayuba, uh, who will be our lead speaker to, to share his presentation. Uh, the idea will be to listen to the two speakers, and then after that, we have the panelists uh, share their presentation, and then from then on, we have uh, about 30 to 40 minutes for discussion and questions. Um, there are a couple of questions that have been sent. I'll be sharing those questions with the panelists, and uh, we'll take it on from there. So without further ado, uh, let me invite Steve. Ayuba to present uh, the DPR perspective on the network code. Steve, thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. Ige. Thank you, our President, Nigerian Gas Association. Uh, first and foremost, I want to really appreciate the Nigerian Gas Association uh, for creating this very excellent opportunity for the industry to then have uh, this platform to review uh, the progress that has been made towards implementing a Nigerian gas transportation network code, which we clearly understand is a critical enabler 
that the uh, optimization of the Nigerian gas value chain requires. I am particularly elated that uh, the president of NGA has actually squarely given us a very excellent perspective of how the journey towards developing an effective Nigerian gas transportation network code has been. So for me this afternoon, I will then just use the time that has been allocated to the Department of Petroleum Resources to clearly try to give us a sufficient insight into all the activities, critical activities that has been carried out by the department to ensure that the Nigerian Gas Transportation Network Code, which was uh, launched by the Honorable Minister of State for Petroleum Resources uh, in February 10th, 2020, that we are able to ensure that this code goes live within the timeline that uh, we're given. Now, practically, we're just going to look at three uh, <clears throat> major aspects in this uh, short speech that we are making. First and foremost, we want to see why it is critical uh, for our gas resources to be optimally utilized. We clearly understand that the extensive gas resource that Nigeria has, it's an opportunity that Nigeria as a country <clears throat> must commit to exploiting in a manner where we use our gas resource to elicit an aggressive and a sustainable national economic development. So we see gas from the Department of Petroleum Resources actually as a game changer for our national economic development. Then I'll delve into greater details on how the network code, <clears throat> it's then been worked upon to ensure that will bring the kind of value that it's expected uh, to bring to the market. And then very quickly wrap up, uh, this session will portray to us what the Department of Petroleum Resources and possibly NGC has uh, clearly established as potential challenges and then uh, how ready the market is. Okay, a bit of a perspective uh, globally. We clearly know a lot of us will be industry players <clears throat> that gas has clearly grown <clears throat> over the many years that the oil and gas industry has been producing energy uh, for the world to then clearly become a fuel which is a fuel of choice both for now and for the immediate future uh, that the world is transiting into. <clears throat> By a lot of the projections that we have, uh, you will find that global economy is projected to continue to grow on a positive trend. Now, anytime uh, the economy seeks to grow, one of the clear enablers that it needs to facilitate such growth is energy. The other aspect <clears throat> that it's a clear driver for how much energy the world will continue to require is the growing population that we're seeing globally. So if you look at the problem, over the last 50 years and going into the next 50 years, you will find very interestingly <clears throat> that while a lot of conventional energy sources have uh, grown to a point where their growth is tapering out, the growth for the use of gas as a major energy supplier has then continued to grow in a very positive uh, dimension. Now, if you at the current uh, realities that we are faced with, with having to grow the economy with a highly decarbonized footprint, then you will clearly see that having gas resources as the fuel that the world must then ensure is optimally available is just a way to go. And for any country that is blessed extensively like Nigeria is with abundant gas resources into over 200 trillion cubic feet, then what we need to begin to do is to really ensure that we're strategic enough to develop a gas value chain 
in a manner where we'll create the kind of competitive advantages that we require. And I think that is why NGA has taken it as a very critical area of pursuit to ensure that one of the critical enabler for ensuring that our domestic gas value chain operate optimally, that the industry is able to have very deep discussion this afternoon. Nigeria, <clears throat> currently in Africa, has the highest gas reserve. We're first. Globally, we are placing at about nine. Uh, we have a reserve of over 200 uh, TCF. Currently, our production stands around eight <clears throat> BCF uh, per day. Uh, by the time we get into the presentation, you will find that those volumes need to grow very aggressively over the next few years if we're going to be able to then optimize the use of our gas resource as a critical economic enabler. A lot of our gas is currently <clears throat> used for export LNG, uh, and then a lot of it is also used uh, by the EMP companies to then ensure that oil production is sustained through either uh, gas reinsurance or then using gas to ensure that oil production is optimized. Uh, but progressively, we are then growing the industry <clears throat> and the strategic need to then ensure that our gas reserve is used to grow our domestic economy in a highly sustainable basis. So you're going to find that gas is needed to drive the realization of the power requirement that our economy needs, the industry, the industry base of Nigeria clearly will benefit from an effective and a robust uh, domestic gas market. And then, of course, the many other <clears throat> commercial users of gas will also benefit optimally when we get our gas markets to be operating optimally. Very unfortunately, we are still flaring our precious gas resources uh, at about 10%, but all of us clearly understand that there are concerted efforts to ensure <clears throat> that we exterminate gas flaring in the very immediate future. Now, very constructively, again, uh, these two slides are just trying to show us that we have a situation where our gas reserves are profiling positively. Uh, and then the president actually put that perspective very well. Currently, we have a proven reserve of about 200 TCF but if we then give the kind of commitment that is required, this proven reserve can easily be tripled. So the issue of having available gas resource is not really an issue. Then looking at how we've been trending on driving utilization and production, you will also find that all the reforms and the initiatives that the federal government and the industry is taking is then creating positive impact in that respect. I think it is with respect to the need to then create a competitive uh, position for the Nigerian gas sector that a lot of the reforms have been driven uh, in the oil and gas industry from as way back as early 2000, culminating <clears throat> into the current uh, status where we are where a lot of the efforts that have been exerted are beginning to clearly demonstrate that we are at a point where we'll begin to optimize the values that are uh, required. The market in Nigeria is pretty robust, as you can see uh, across the midstream uh, value chain that we have. The opportunities are pretty extensive, and we just trust that with the full operationalization of the network code, we will really then as a nation and as an oil and gas industry begin to optimize the use of our gas resources. So again, what is the network code? So the network code, as it is clearly known, is a common, is a common set of rules that will govern a fair and transparent, more specifically, gas shipper, and gas uh, transporter relationship in Nigeria, where that relationship will then be optimally regulated or administered to ensure that there's an effective open access gas transmission in Nigeria. 
It clearly comprises of legal and contractual frameworks that have been fairly developed for the case of the Nigerian Gas Transportation Network code to ensure that uh, at the point where the code goes live, we will be able to then begin to see values in the domestic gas sector that will deepen the accelerated development of this sector as is required. Uh, so Nigeria's, uh, Nigeria's transportation gas, uh, the Nigerian Gas Transportation Network code was definitely developed to be a world-class network code, and that is why you will find that we took a lot of learnings from a very matured uh, network code, which is the UK network code. For a start, uh, the network code is going to cover just two transmission systems, for a start. <clears throat> but eventually, as you're going to see, see in the roadmap that we'll show, we will quickly work to expand the capacity of the network code to practically cover all the gas transmission systems that we currently have in Nigeria. Who are going to be the key players in the network code regime? We'll have the players playing, I mean the suppliers, uh, playing a lot of roles. Uh, the transporter, it's going to be very critical to ensuring uh, that we have an effective network code that is driving the kind of values that we need in the Nigerian gas value chain. And very critically, the shippers and the agents are going uh, to be major players in the implementation of the network code. Now, the network code for a start is going to cover just the gas transmission system. And then the scope of activities that you're going to be seeing around the code uh, that was launched by the Honorable Minister in February will then cover the activities that will require upstream gas to then be supplied through the licensed gas transmission systems onto the designated points where shippers Will then, will then be expected to take the gas that has been applied uh, from our upstream. And then the code in itself will then be administered to ensure that there is non-discriminatory access to the pipeline system. The code is going to be monitored and uh, administered to ensure that there is guaranteed security there is reliable uh, availability of the gas transmission system and that the necessary safety required for all of the transaction across the gas network hold are optimally guaranteed. Uh, Dr. Ige began to speak around the third point <clears throat> on wanting to create a domestic gas market that is operating within the optimal fundamentals of any effective market structure. The network code, we see it as a great enabler through the cost reflective tariffing at, at some point uh, down the line pricing uh, methodology that we're going uh, to be monitoring in the implementation of the network code. The network code will begin to ensure uh, that some of those glaring market uh, aspirations are met. Now, another very important aspect of the code, which a lot of us that have gone through the code will have seen, is that <clears throat> because the transactions around the code are going to be numerous, uh, the transactions around the code are going to have a lot of extensive legal and commercial issues, we know absolutely that there will be situations where disputes will arise. So the network code is providing a clear mechanism for how disputes will be effectively handled in the implementation of the code. Now, to begin to speak very specifically to what the operationalization plan of the network code is, you will find that between now and 2020, that's on a short to a medium term basis, uh, the network code is going to be administered to ensure that these clear milestones are realized. Uh, in 2020, we set out to ensure that the launch, that the, that, that the code is fully developed and that the code is launched 
And with the launching of the code in 2020, we are then working very assiduously to ensure that the code is brought into full operationalization. Now that is going to happen in quarter three. Quarter three, very, very specifically from the directive that the Honorable Minister gave will then place us uh, sometimes around second week of August. Immediately that is done, that you're going to find that we will then begin to carry out all the necessary activities. We'll begin to drive all the necessary initiatives that are required to ensure that we optimize the performance of the network code. That we optimize the performance of the network code in a manner where the network code will clearly be seen to be creating positive impact on the performance of the domestic gas market. Now, a lot of, a lot of the initiatives uh, that will require this to be realized between quarter three, 2020, and quarter three, 2021, are already being discussed as various forums. Uh, we've engaged extensively with the industry, I mean, including Nigerian Gas Association, very closely, and we're going to continue to engage on a highly collaborative basis to ensure that we don't miss any of the timelines that we're setting on this roadmap. Now, immediately we're able to develop the kind of confidence that we need to then ensure that the network code is beginning to create optimal value in the domestic gas market. Then you will see us then beginning to push to really drive for growth in the scope of coverage that the network code must have in the domestic gas market. And that will be very strategically followed through to ensure that all the objectives, the strategic objectives of the network code are clearly met in a manner where the network code must be seen to be helping to mature the domestic gas market as quickly as we can. So on a very high level and on a two-year premise, that is the roadmap that we are currently working with to ensure that we bring the network code to a point where its impact will really begin to create the kind of effect that will require in the market. But to be more specific on the current status, where are we on the current status <clears throat> for operationalizing the network code within the six months target that the Honorable Minister directed? So in February, all of us are very conversant with this. The code was launched. Uh, the Department of Petroleum Resources ensured uh, that the code was transmitted to practically all the industry players. And then for anyone that has not received a complimentary copy of the code from the Department of Petroleum Resources, you can go to the website of the DPR where the code and a copy of the ancillary document has been uploaded. So that was done in February. But between March and now, quite a lot of activities have taken place to then ensure that we're really working very smartly and uh, in a very well-focused manner to ensure that uh, the August deadline is kept. What are some of the key activities that we have undertaken? Number one, because we want to run the administration of the network code on a highly, highly collaborative basis in the industry, where we have uh, inclusiveness of practically all the key players, uh, the Department of Petroleum Resources conducted very extensive stakeholder engagement. The stakeholder engagements are continuing. I mean, after this meeting today, we have a meeting that has been scheduled with another major shipper uh, in the industry. So that was done. We took a lot of learnings from all of those stakeholder engagements, and then we're being guided by a lot of the insights that we receive to then continue to appropriate all of the things that are needed to ensure that we go live seamlessly. Now, number two, uh, major activity that DPR had then worked on, and we are practically at the concluding aspect of this, is to then develop the re regimes of licenses that will then govern the network hold. Operationalization of the network hold is going to be governed uh, through practically three licenses that the regulator will be issuing. 
the transporter license, the shipper's license, and then the offtake profile notice uh, agent license. Now, the license requirements have been established. Uh, the license have been designed. Uh, the license fee regimes are being firmed up. And uh, number three, then, <clears throat> uh, has seen DPR then really working very assiduously. One of the things that the regulator wants to ensure happens for the network code is efficient and a highly effective regulatory administration of the code. Now, one of the tools we want to use to realize that is to then put an effective or a robust electronic management system that will then govern all of our interaction and our administrative role on the network code. So you're going to find that uh, this electronic management system is going to process, receive applications for all the licenses, process the applications for the licenses that are required. But then this electronic management system for the network code is then going to be the platform that the regulator is then going to use to provide the effective monitoring that is required. We're going to extend the use of this platform to then also cover all the other regulatory administrative roles that are expected of the regulator uh, in the administration of the network code to ensure that uh, progressively we remain on the path where we will drive for the realization of the major milestones that we indicated on the roadmap. Uh, and then number four, we are then working with great industry support, like I said, including NGA, to ensure that operationalization of the network code will be as, heat, as minimally hitch-free as it's possible. And then lastly, <clears throat> we are going to be issuing guidelines that will then really make it easy for all the prospective licensees and the operators of the network code uh, to, to be guided in securing the licenses and to also be guided in how the existing GTAs are going to be migrated. So that is March to June. From July to August, practically really just about six weeks, you're going to find us working <clears throat> to then launch the electronic management system. We're actually looking at week two of July uh, to do this. Minute, so, please. okay, sorry. Week, okay, thank you, sir. Week two uh, to launch uh, the portal. Uh, week two of July, we are going to begin to receive applications for licenses. Uh, we are working with NGC to ensure that the gas transmission system is ready. Uh, we are still going to conduct, in addition to what we're doing today, a, an industry-wide pre-go-life stakeholder workshop. All of us are going to be invited, and then we'll work to ensure that all the uh, network code framework, from framework agreements are signed. And then once that is done, the network code has gone live, and then we'll switch our mode into monitoring and administering the code. My last slide then has to speak very briefly to the challenges and uh, <clears throat> the market readiness that we've seen. So for us, three clear segments, we are putting literally all the challenges that we know in the market into three clear segments. Number one, we need to have a market that is matured. Currently, the domestic gas market is submatured to then begin to draw the kind of investment and create the kind of value that is required. But number two, uh, the dirt of uh, critical gas supply infrastructure, which we know government is working uh, very hard to cover. Uh, it's another challenge that needs to be closed out very quickly. And thirdly, and very importantly, the challenges of weak contract sanctity and the extensive change management scope that we are going to have to handle in the full operationalization of the network code is another bracket of challenge. Is the market ready for the network code? We think the market is because there are uh, adequate re regulatory frameworks that are existing. Number two, transparency in regulatory roles is improving. The gas value chain, we are developing gas value chain intersectoral collaboration 
across, for example, uh, oil and gas and uh, NERC to ensure that we're able to support to ma the market optimally. Ongoing sectoral reforms across gas value chain will continue to then ensure that the market is uh, performing optimally. The government and the regulators have continued to provide optimum support for the domestic gas market. There's an, improve, an improving ease of doing business in Nigeria. And then, of course, the underlying parameter for all of this push is the extensive domestic gas market opportunities that we have. So in conclusion, we clearly know that Nigeria is blessed with abundant natural gas resources. Therefore, a robust gas sector presents extensive investment and development opportunities for the country. Effective oper operationalization of the gas network code shall create a transparent and optimally available open access pipeline regime that will accelerate the growth of the domestic gas market. And finally, uh, we just want to make an open commitment today that you can take us on as the regulators. The DPR is going to be fully committed to sustaining effective collaboration with all stakeholders in the gas value segment of the oil and gas industry to ensure that the strategic objectives of all the reforms in the sectors are achieved, including the network code. We thank NGA for this opportunity to speak to the industry and we look forward to a very engaging conversation around a lot of the concerns that the industry might have. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Stephen, for that excellent uh, introduction and overview of uh, DPR's perspective on the on the network code. Uh, I think that was uh, really helpful and it sets the tone for the afternoon, uh, basically. Uh, just uh, like you say, he mentioned that the network code in the first instance is going to be uh, focused on the ELPS and the Obena Jakota pipeline. So it's mainly focused on the gas transmission pipeline. Uh, on the ELPS network in the first instance. Uh, he has talked about the market readiness, uh, you know, for the network code. Uh, and so there's been a lot of concerns by people. Is the market truly ready for the code? Uh, clearly from uh, the DPR, uh, there is a lot on ground now for us to drive this, uh, this market to, to, to grow. In. Talked about the implementation plan. And um, basically 2020 is to launch the application and get started. Uh, 2021, optimize the application and towards 2022 to consolidate and uh, establish it across the entire market in terms of a road roadmap. And there's been a significant uh, stakeholder engagement towards that, uh, that, that sort of launch. Uh, so I think that's a pretty good start. And um, I think at this time, I'd like to also invite Peter Cameron uh, to share his presentation. He brings a perspective from the UK uh, network code uh, to this discussion. Peter, uh, please, uh, you have the floor uh, about 14 minutes there about. Thank you. Please unmute. Uh, Peter, do you want to unmute yourself? There we are. I'm unmuted and I'm on share screen. Good. Okay, thank you very much. So I would, um, so I've been asked to talk about the network code in the UK and some other countries and their applicability to Nigeria. So my company is. Uh, my company is Energy Markets Global. There's our address, where we operate, and some of our clients. Okay, I'd like to talk about the very briefly the history and structure of the UK as you're basing the fundamentals of the Nigeria network code on the UK one. We shall have a quick look at the background to the UK and how we, um, how we come to the UK network code look at some alternatives to particular parts and implications for Nigeria. Okay, with, I thought we'd start at the very beginning. The UK network code has, uh, has been around a long time, or the UK gas industry rather has been around a long time. Actually founded the Westminster Gas Light and Coke Company in 1812. So that's uh, 200 years ago, a long time. 
And I just wanted to show you this picture, the ladies on the gas holder having their cup of tea at tea time. So the, that was the foundation and many uh, independent town gas companies um, producing gas from coal. And, and then in nationalization in 1948, corporatization in 1972, and privatization in 1986. At that time, British Gas was the largest gas company in the world and the largest share register of any company with over 2 million shareholders. Then there were various restructurings as the company became um, more ready for the commercial privatized market, split into three companies, Centrica, which basically carried on the shipper and supplier activities, the trading part, active in U, um, UK, continental Europe and, uh, and North America. National Grid operates the transport system and BG, which now became, um, which now is part of Shell. UK today, the point of this is, if you look at the map, it's a very complex network. These, the blue and the green shown there, are, is the transmission system, the high pressure transmission system. Within that, there are 12 distribution zones, which have been now congregated into four or so distribution companies. Six entry points, three international pipeline links, and more than 200 exit points, plus three um, LNG import terminals. These are the, uh, the distribution companies. Okay, so the key points of this, it's, it's a very large industry. Uh, more than 17 or 79 billion cubic meters or 7.6 billion cubic feet a day of demand, over 20 million customers, a long history, nearly uh, 200 years. And it's, and the industry is in constant change. Whatever we talk about a few months later, you will find another change. And this is entirely private sector. There is the um, government regulator, but of course the regulator is often is independent of central government. And the industry itself is entirely private sector. Many, many players, there's one major transporter, National Grid, plus about 10 other independent transporter companies, six distributors or so, more than 80, I'd say more than 80, there's something like 200 registered shippers and suppliers, 30 are active in some way um, and there are about four um, key um, major gas shippers and suppliers. So it's a complex network, over 3 million customer changes a year, 4 billion pounds in invoices for transportation each year. So that's the a key point to note. Now moving on from this, the, the network code, um, Perhaps I'd better give a little bit of background, as was described before. The network code is a system to allow companies, uh, shippers, uh, traders to put their gas into um, a transport system on an open access basis so that everybody can get equal or equitable and transparent and fair access to their customers. So the key point is that there is a separation between transportation and trading. A transport company may not buy and sell gas, except for those small amounts to ensure its own balancing. And the trading company may not own and operate transport systems. Now, it's, uh, we talk about shippers, it's, uh, it's a peculiar um, British terminology, which has been confusing. The shipper, if you like, is like a wholesaler. They buy and sell gas, and they arrange for transport through the transport system. The supplier is the person who is the, that personal company that sells gas to companies, to customers at the, uh, at the meter point. So if you like, a shipper is like a wholesaler, supplier is like a retailer. But uh, it's easier to think of them as one thing, the trader and the transporter. Okay, then UK network code, uniform network code, it's called that because it covers transportation and distribution. So it's one uniform code that covers the whole industry. Uh, so there are these five main points of it. There are a number of general provisions, including trans 
um, transition arrangements. Transportation principle document off takes European interconnection. So um, despite Brexit, the UK is a part of the European continent. And as I said, there are into, into um, there are pipelines in connecting UK with continental Europe. And there is EU legislation on network codes that the UK has to comply with. In addition to the uniform network code, there are also independent gas transporters and each of those have their own independent transport codes. So every transporter must have a, tra a, a gas tra a network code. Every shipper must agree to abide by that code. And there are interconnection agreements for when one transport system is connected to another. I'm not going to run through all of those, but you can see these are the key points in the, uh, of the, um, the transportation principle documents. Uh, those experts in network code will recognize all of the areas here. And again, offtake arrangements documents a large number of measures to do with um, operating the downstream distribution end. Okay, I just wanted to pull up some key points from this. The key. So a uniform code, as I said, transports and distribution. There are, in addition, independent gas transporters with their own codes. Uh, I explain the difference between a transporter and a shipper or supplier. Now, another key thing about the UK is the use of the national balancing point. So this is, a, this is the virtual hub. In other words, when you put gas into the system, it, by magic, goes to an imaginary point somewhere in the middle of the entire transport network. It is gathered at that point and then sent out from that point to exit, po exit um, points. So gas pricing is based off this and transportation charges are based off this. You have a charge from the entry point to the NBP, national balancing points, and then to the exit point. So this is a key difference between UK and Nigeria, the fact that, that we have an operating hub. And this is, uh, has many implications, uh, which I'll come on to. Another point is the heavy IT requirements. There are enormous IT requirements in the UK system. Uh, UK link nominations by another system called Gemini. Uh, I had a look at the, uh, the company that runs this, Exoserve, which is, uh, it's a company run by the gas industry. So all the gas industries are members, or the different players are members of this and appoint the board and shareholders to it. So Exoserve has the software licenses um, are valued at 88 million pounds, and it has an annual turnover. Just to be honest. <laughs> The IT turnover is 65 million pounds. So in other words, operating a UK type IT system will give you not much change out of 100 million pounds. Connected system entry and exit points I mentioned, and you have separate arrangements to cover that, connecting between different transport systems. Supply point administration is important. This is a central record which the uh, Exoserve and uh, UK link holds, holding the details of every single meter point, every single customer, so that every time someone changes, a shipper changes or a customer changes from one shipper to another, that is recorded so that transporters know how to who to deliver to and who to bill. Balancing, daily balancing, and I think the daily balancing and the requirements for that is a large part of the, um, the heavy IT requirements. Imbalance charges, again, it's a complicated market-based system. Because there is the national balancing points, there are active, very active um, trading markets. And the NBP was the largest gas trading point hub in Europe. It's probably been overtaken um, by the um, uh, one in Emden in Netherlands now recently, but it's still um, a massive trading point. And so shippers can balance 
during the day by buying or selling gas at the hub. So, but in addition to that, hub trading, um, look at the bottom, shippers can balance by varying their swing production up or down. They can use an over-the-counter market. This is a daily balancing market that the uh, operator Transco uses to balance during the day. Shippers can bilaterally contract with one another. They don't have to go through the network code or through the um, or, or through the hub. They can just bilaterally contract with other shippers directly. And of course, they can manage demand, demand management if, uh, if they're running short. I should have mentioned storage as well. So all these ways in which you can um, balance now and meet your um, nominations and scheduling requirements. Now these lead to this, these are physical elements. There's also, this leads then to financial derivatives, hedging and various speculative measures. So gas trading becomes a volatile trading speculative markets operating under the Financial Services Authority. So it's, it's a financial derivatives market. Imbalance charges at system average price and system marginal price. That's this slide here. So within tolerance, you're charged at the average price. The left hand column would be something like 40 pence there. But if you're out of balance, if you put in too much or too little, you buy or sell at the system marginal price. So if you look at this example, you've got a marginal, um, the, the lowest price is something like seven pence or something, and the highest one something like 87. So if you're out of balance using this system, this is enormous, and this is the sort of thing that can bankrupt a company. So the incentives to stay in balance are enormous. This combined with the IT requirements really means under the daily balancing system of the UK, only big companies who have the financial and technical strengths can, can, can operate effectively. So key points, complex, entirely private sector. Another point is modifications committee. This is the industry has a modifications committee and they meet regularly and various subcommittees and there is a company set up that allows for this yeah, balancing markets are... sorry, sorry but... as i just about two minutes okay i shall i shall rush on i think i've finished on that point modifications <laughs> committee uh is entirely the ind industry led and Ofgem, the regulator can give approval, but they take no part in the meetings. Uh, two examples here of alternatives to the balancing arrangements, uh, which are much simpler. The United States operates a monthly rather than daily balancing system, and they just have a system of um, discounts to a daily gas price. And Ireland and okay. Ukraine as well, I mentioned there, I mentioned Crane because for two reasons. One is because I worked on that, designing that system, and so I know something about it. Also because Ukraine is very similar to, to Nigeria in the sense that it's a point-to-point -point system, you, um, rather than a complex network of the UK. So what are the implications for Nigeria in the last minute or so? Nigeria is not a network, it's a point-to-point -point system. You have gas comes in at one point, goes along the pipeline, you have exit, various exit points on that. Not yet a connected system. A much smaller system with fewer players. The wholesale market is not yet achieved, so you don't have that single balancing point or hub. So how you can acquire gas to balance is, is a key area. I would like to talk more about the operational balancing agreements of the Nigeria Network Code and the uh, benefits and, and concerns and any concerns with that. In conclusion, Nigeria needs a much simpler IT system. Um, it's good to base on the UK because the UK was the leader in liberalising gas markets and the first network codes were developed in the UK. Um, the idea, the concepts apply, but the details of the UK system does not apply. It's, it's a much more complex system. 
I think we should be looking at a month, more monthly balancing rather than daily balancing for Nigeria. Certainly nominations daily and keeping daily tabs, but monthly balancing. Modifications processed is important. I say they're rust, robust, but it should be strong and clear, transparent. Industries led with strong input from shippers as well as the transporters. Regulatory oversight, but not necessarily regulatory involvement. Okay, I think that uh, covers all of my points. So um, I rush through. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Peter. I think that was, uh, again, another excellent perspective, uh, giving us a view as to what's going on in the UK and how that has evolved up until now. Um, I think clearly the UK is, uh, is a very advanced system, but there is no doubt, you know, when, when we were conceiving the gas network code, the, it was always recognized that the Nigerian market was gonna evolve very rapidly. And so nine years ago or 10 years ago, when this started, the number of players in the market is nowhere near the number of players that it is right now. And so the market is growing and expected to grow just as rapidly over time, uh, like you said. Uh, you talked a lot about the, the balancing and it's clear from balance, which is a key feature of the network code, that the required discipline that would be expected from the market participants uh, is gonna be high. Otherwise the, uh, the penalties can be huge. Uh, going forward, which is one of the kinds of things that the network code was intended to, to bring on board in, in, in Nigeria. And um, I think uh, as we, we go into the discussion, it'll be good to get you know, further conversation around you know, monthly versus daily balancing, like you said, I mean, what, what, what should work best for Nigeria uh, really in terms of reconciliation at the end of every uh, gas cycle. So uh, very good insight. Uh, thank you very much for that. I think it's a good time now to hear the, uh, the operator of the network themselves, that's the NGC. They are gonna be playing a supremely critical role in this network code. And so I'd like to invite uh, Mary Rose uh, to share the NGC perspective and readiness uh, for this. Uh, Mary, are you there? Uh, have about 10 minutes or so to you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, all. My name is Mabel Owodiesa. Unfortunately, uh, the General Manager Commercial, NGC, is uh, tied up in a meeting. She thought she would be with us, but she's not here. But I'll go ahead and share uh, the presentation on her behalf. And uh, I'm here with my colleague Yeti, who will also be able to uh, stand in for her, hopefully. So for the um, NGC presentation, it's on the topic of the webinar, Nigerian Gas Transportation Network Code Highlights, Potentials, Challenges, and Domestic Market Readiness. Um, we'll just go through a few uh, outline points. There'll be an introduction, the key features of the network code. Uh, we'll talk a bit on the operational readiness of the transportation network. Uh, the operationalization of the network code, implications for the gas industry, challenges, and finally, conclusion. As an introduction, um, we know the network code, as has been largely said, is a contractual framework between the gas transportation network operator, that's NGC, and gas shippers basically specifying the terms and the rules for operation and use of the transportation network. The network code was conceptualized by the Nigerian Gas Master Plan. The Nigerian Gas Policy also recognizes it. Uh, it provides non-discriminatory open access to the gas transportation network. Uh, simply put, um, since currently we're in the GTA regime, it can be viewed as a multi-party gas transportation agreement. We'll speak more on this uh, as we go on. 
What are the objectives? Um, one, to ensure non-discriminatory access to the transportation system, to introduce uniform and standard contract terms, to reduce the time required to engage new shippers. So we have a standard template, the network code document, and we don't need to do a bilateral negotiation on those common terms. Guaranteed discipline in the use of the transportation network and enhance competition and support growth of the entire gas industry. Uh, the NNPC developed the network code in consultation with DPRO and um, other stakeholders like the OPTS, uh, GACN, and other in the, the power companies and other stakeholders. Uh, as we have heard, the code was launched on 10 February 2020 by the Honorable Minister of State for Petroleum Resources. Uh, the pipeline system stated in the code that to be covered by it, uh, listed that the Escravos Lagos pipeline system, there will be an Ajakuta pipeline system. The OB3 pipeline is also listed. You know, it's an ongoing project that uh, we hope to deliver shortly. The timeline for transition given by the minister is six months from the uh, launch date, and that's 10th of August, 2020. Uh, so we spoke about the GTAs. Currently, this is the scenario we have uh, in the industry. You have the gas transporter, NGC, having individual gas transportation agreements with its customers. So for each customer, as we have on the right of your screen, customer A has his GTA, customer B has his GTA, and you know they're not perfect, perfectly uniform. There are some variations since they're negotiated bilaterally. Now in the new regime, what's happening is the network code is coming in as a uniform document, as we said earlier, and the gas transportation agreements will fall off. So everybody is open to the same uh, uh, contract terms. Now onto the key features of the network code. So it has several sections, about 14 of them, listed A to N. So I'll just quickly run through some of the key uh, provisions. Uh, the section on system classification basically talks of the pipeline systems covered by the code, talks of the system entry point, points from which gas enters the system, and exit points where shippers uptake their gas. System user and capacity spells out the requirements for booking capacity on the network. The uh, talks of the tra applicable transportation charges and uh, capacity transfer. Now, this is uh, uh, one of the new things the code brings on. Capacity can be transferred between shippers. Uh, section C talks of nomination, talks of the procedure for making nominations, timings, and other related things. Then there's also the trade nomination. So shippers can actually trade gas online, that is on the system. They just have to provide matching um, trade no nominations, referred to as acquiring trade and disposing trade. So this is another flexibility it brings in. Operational balance in that section D talks about the balancing actions the operator may need to take. It could be seeking as shipper assistance, a connected facility operator assistance, could use curtailment and other necessary actions, like in the case of an emergency. Um, section E talks of the daily quantities and imbalances, where it talks of daily imbalance, cumulative imbalance, and measurement reconciliation. Uh, F talks of the system clearing and balancing charges, where it talks of over delivery and on the delivery thresholds. This actually mark it to about 20% of the total uh, capacity, registered capacity a shipper has on the network. Then it talks of balancing charges where you, these are like penalties where you don't abide by the provisions of the code. You have the cumulative imbalance charge and the scheduling charge. Then there are tolerances around this. You have the shrinkage gas, basically talking of the shrinkage factor. The code talks of uh, shippers providing uh, gas to be used by the operator for own use and for unaccounted for gas. But I must just quickly say, but well, that is when it's, 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 uh, the operator has to ensure he's operating as a reasonable and prudent operator. Wastages are not to be covered 
by this shrinkage factor. Uh, entry requirements talks about the required network entry agreement that is required for all entry points, basically specifying what the entry provisions are and the local operating pr procedures, gas specification, uh, measuring equipment at such points. Now you need this for each individual entry point into the network. Same thing applies for the exit points, that's offtake points, gas offtake points from the network. So that is just a mirror of the entry point requirement. Then the section J talks of maintenance and operational planning. There's a, there's a requirement in the code that the operator provides a maintenance program in November, by the last uh, week of November in each year. Um, in Invoicing and payment just addresses invoice types, invoice payments, due dates, uh, queries, and how they'll be handled. Dispute resolution, uh, the methods um, the code uh, specifies, the expert determination, mediation, and arbitration. Now, the uh, section M uh, talks is a general section where it talks of shipper, shipper admission requirements for that's in trying to become a shipper, the requirements are there. The code credit rules. This basically talks of uh, providing a like bank guarantee letter of credits for given periods, just to uh, basically a guarantee of payment and uh, what 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 to guarantee the, the operator that um, a, a customer is still viable to make his due payment. Uh, this continuing shipper talks of termination. These are just um, boilerplate legal provisions, termination, confidentiality. Uh, then it talks of the agent, liability, indemnities, force majeure, notices, assignment, jurisdiction, and governing law. Of course, the governing law is the Nigerian law. Then finally, section N is the interpretation, basically defining terms used in the network code. So that's all about the, uh, okay, so uh, in summary, you could say um, the features of the code are that the network code establishes clear rules by which the shipper may introduce gas to the network and obtain gas from the network. Maybe I'll have to. Okay, okay, so I'll just be fast, but maybe I, maybe I could skip this because I've basically gone through the network code. Um, so just uh, uh, if I go on to the operational readiness, I'll quickly say NGC is operationally ready to go live with its current pipeline network. Uh, it ha already has custody transfer meters, volumetric flow controls, online gas chromatograph. In addition, we are also trying to improve on this. So we have the pipeline expansion projects like the ELPS, uh, the OB3. We're trying to put a SCADA system in place. Uh, we're also carrying out things like integrity assignment, uh, assessment to make sure our pipelines are always in good shape uh, and, and all that. So we are working on all that. Uh, operationalizing the code will say the existing gas transportation agreements were largely developed in line with the network code. So they have similar provisions. This will make it easy for the migration of GTAs to the code. NGC has commenced engagements with its shippers and other stakeholders to create awareness on this code. Uh, under the network code, like the DPRO um, staff said, um, we require a license. The shippers also require a license. Uh, draft agreements have been reviewed and uh, even sent to parties, relevant parties for review ahead of implementation. Uh, book capacities, uh, capacities in the GTAs, we intend to recognize them as the registered capacities under the code, except advised uh, otherwise. From the go-live date of the network code, operator and shippers will no longer abide by the terms of the GTAs, but by those of the network code. New shippers will be signed under the terms of the network code. Um, briefly, implications for the industry. I think this has actually um, been gone through. Uh, clear terms, open access, more flexibility, like I said, with introduction of things like uh, capacity uh, transfer and trading. Uh, the, the, the DPRO is the regulator, is now in the field of play. Uh, greater transparency is required, increased operational efficient, efficiency, both on the side of operator and on uh, ship, shippers part. And it also introduces some more participants like the agents. Uh, challenges, some we've been able to identify. Ability to satisfy several parties with a single document. 
yeah, network host is just one, whereas we had several GTAs. So, so the way forward we think is patterns should be accommodating because using one fits all size, uh, everybody has to try and adjust to, to, uh, to achieve that. Introduction of a licensing regime and its attendant cost. For this, we say the licensing cost should be moderate to accommodate all players. Slowdown of activities, the COVID-19 pandemic and trying to meet the go live date, but then we need to make the most of what is available. Uh, managing stakeholders' response to change. So there needs to be continuous stakeholders' engagement like what we are currently having now. And then managing other agreements. This is an issue with some of our shippers uh, that are linked to the GTAs, e uh, for example, some financing agreements. So we need to work on aligning such agreements to the network code. In conclusion, the network code has been launched, as we've been told, and it will soon go live. It's important that all participants and stakeholders in the gas industry familiarize themselves with the network code. In light of the benefits the gas industry stands to gain from its implementation, we should all work together to ensure its seamless and early implementation. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mabel. And uh, that, was, that was excellent and uh, lightning speed, you know. As, um, I think we've heard the NGC perspective of the uh, readiness for uh, the network code. Um, she had mentioned that open access is guaranteed on the, uh, on the transportation network already, because I see quite a few questions around that. Although I know the issue of open access is a lot more critical on the distribution network than uh, on, the, on the national transmission, which is already open access anyway. Um, so basically has also confirmed that from an NGC perspective, the, they're operationally ready in the sense that the existing metering systems, the volume, volumetric control systems, uh, the chromatographs and so on, are all in a situation or position that they can be leveraged uh, pretty much right away for the immediate implementation of the network code. Again, um, I see quite a lot of questions regarding that. So NGC has spoken. They, they, they are, they're able, even though not perfect right now, but they are indeed able to operationalize the network code uh, now. And of course, the SCADA system is being implemented and shortly uh, that will further enhance the uh, efficiency of that. He said clearly that the existing or some of the GTAs you have now have been structured originally uh, to line up with the network code, which further enhances the ease with which things can transition. And um, uh, finally, the uh, post go live date, uh, the the network code rules will govern the transportation network, and the GTAs will uh, will basically take a second seat. So, to an extent, uh, you can see very clearly that NGC is sort of ready for for this take of uh, of the network code. Um, now, I think it's time for us to hear our panelists, um, and uh, they 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 are. They are not agents of government, so they're 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 mm -hmm. uh, stakeholders in the in the in the segment, and it'll be good to hear their perspective. I'd like to start off with uh, James uh, Odiase, uh, who will give us his his view, and then uh, we'll take it on from there. Uh, so, James, uh, please, uh, you've got about yeah, six. thank minutes. you, thank you, David. Uh, I thank the uh, the presenters. Uh, I just uh, give my own perspective along three thematic uh, uh, areas. Uh, the first one uh, is on regulatory and governance of the process. The first uh, thing is that if we are talking about open access in broad terms, you know, we and therefore the liberalization of the gas market, we need to uh, extend the regulatory cover to other networks because what you have now, you know, if we are going with uh, the NGC and its cheapers, we all know across the industry that accessing the NGC network is the easiest. But the problem really in terms of uh, liberalizing the network has to do with how gas can be shipped across the other net, net networks. Uh, I've spent uh, the last three years of my 
career, just trying to structure a deal to get 25 million of, of gas from the eastern flank, uh, eastern uh, Niger Delta up to Alauji. And that to date has not worked because for that you needed to go through the owner's uh, network to NGC's network to Shell's uh, network. So crafting uh, a, a regulation that will make all these uh, independent players subject themselves to this uh, code will be key uh, to liberalize the, the market. The other thing is um, just looking at the interpretation session and uh, particularly the modification rules, uh, it, we need assurance that um, it will have a proper regulatory oversight because as currently defined, uh, it is not part of the code and um, the industry will therefore leave it to the operator to develop the rules. So as uh, Peter's um, uh, presentation has shown, it should, be, uh, uh, it should be something that is handled and with full participation of uh, broad stakeholders with uh, regulatory oversight. Then there is the issue of uh, uh, the protocol for licensing. Uh, uh, as the NGC presenter has uh, highlighted, it should be at minimal cost. Uh, the parties, particularly just looking at uh, uh, the commencement with the NGC network, the parties are proving shippers and operator, you know, under the legacy agreement. So we are licensing them invariably for what they already are. And therefore the, uh, the licensing fee should be minimal or indeed should be, uh, be at, no, at no cost, at least for those uh, uh, legacy players. Then there is the general perspective that um, the terms of the, of the code seem to be uh, favorable, more favorable to the operator, uh, you know, and just looking at uh, a typical GTA and what the operator gets under the code, uh, it is apparent that, um, you know, uh, the operator goes away with uh, what they could get under uh, uh, bilateral deals. Then uh, the second area I want to talk about is uh, just highlighting some of the uh, commercial issues. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, this code or subjecting uh, transactions under the code does not invariably increase the gas price to the end customers. Uh, we have just talked about uh, the, the licensing fee. There, if you look at the code, there are all sorts of operational uh, charges ranging from uh, overall charges, system buy and uh, system sell prices, scheduling uh, prices. If I just take uh, the overall charge at 30%, I think that is a, a steep, at least for the Nigerian market. Uh, then if you look at the system uh, buy and sell prices, it talks about buying gas, uh, you know, for balancing at the, uh, highest price of the 110 percent of uh, the highest price, highest GSA price, whereas the operator will buy at 90 percent of uh, the lowest G GSA price. So, if you therefore take uh, a GBI uh, shipper uh, through the network, you know, with um, being the lowest, and it could invariably be buying gas at 100% uh, of, uh, of his own uh, uh, gas price. So this arrangement we need to look into, otherwise you can easily bankrupt uh, uh, some of the uh, shippers. Uh, then there's the issue of uh, the complexity of the commercial framework. Uh, we need to uh, realize that um, for most of the shippers, they are also the uh, connected facility owners. So rather than having multiple agreements between the same parties, maybe 
there, there is the opportunity to consolidate uh, the terms of the relationship between those parties in, um, in a consolidated ag agreement. Then I think uh, there, there is this section that has to do with the attribution of liabilities at uh, uh, system points. You have um, all the, the code currently contemplates uh, homogeneous uh, uh, delivery of gas at a system point. And therefore, if you have multiple, uh, multiple uh, shippers at a delivery point, there may be one of them that is um, probably not compliant, but the court sees that non compliance as being the fault of all and therefore all are, are liable. So we need to address that. Then there's the issue of the adequacy of the adequacy of the uh, of the LDs and the liability caps. So there's a uh, in um, in age there is the uh, the liability cap set at uh, fifty percent of uh, the charge uh, the transportation charge for the day. Uh, in M, you know, it gives. Uh, uh, two different liability caps. All these need to be uh, harmonized to ensure that they are uh, fully, fully uh, adequate. Then I, I think one of the definitions that is confusing is the excluded uptake circumstances. We need to know the circumstances under which the, uh, the operator can be left off the hook uh, without uh, liability and therefore uh, then I'll quickly just talk about the operational uh, items. It's good to note that uh, NGC is prepared. One minute, James. Yeah, it's good to note that NGC is prepared, but the main thing is that they, they have to demonstrate firm operational control because uh, from experience, there have been instances where a shipper can easily bump off another shipper from the, uh, from the network just due to the hydraulics of the system. Um, the deployment of uh, the metering infrastructure, they've highlighted, and uh, I'm glad about that. But the main thing is to make sure that the standards of those uh, metering uh, uh, facilities are consistent with what's required under the gas master plan and therefore in Schedule 3 of the GSAA. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you very much, James. I think that was, uh, that was very good in terms of uh, very operational issues that need to be addressed with the, uh, with the code uh, before implementation. Uh, you raised a lot of uh, very germane point, uh, which I think we need to you know, address as part of the implementation. Uh, in particular, things relating to the commercial framework uh, to ensure that uh, further thought is put into into liabilities, uh, penalties, and uh, you know all those charges uh, that are going to be coming. Uh, so in the end, it, do it doesn't become counterproductive. I think the purpose of the code is not to uh, drive uh, shippers or buyers into some kind of bankruptcy. So it's important that we we have a, a look at those. Um, we also talk about complexities of the commercial framework vis-a-vis uh, -vis shippers and, and so on. Um, and then uh, we also talk about the, the, you know, it appears as if the, the way it's been structured is more favorable to the operators. I suspect you're talking about the capacity charges and the way that is sort of locked down uh, for the operator uh, as a revenue. So uh, this seems to be very uh, interesting. You, you talk also about the, the bit around the open access, uh, even beyond what I had mentioned in terms of open access being a a distributor, uh, a major thing with distribu distributor network. Uh, clearly, even in the transmission high pressure networks, uh, there are still issues of open network, uh, open access uh, that, are, that need to be addressed. And although that may not be an issue on the ELPS side of things, but clearly on the Eastern side where you have the seven energy network uh, interfacing with the NGC network, interfacing with total network and OPL, clearly, um, if we do have uh, open access issues there, it would affect uh, delivery. So a lot of interesting point. Thank you very much for, for those insights. Um, I guess when we get to the discussion, we'll elaborate a little bit more on those. 
Uh, let me move on very swiftly then to uh, Fulusha Agrakoba to give us a perspective, uh, probably from the IOC point of view. Fulusha, thank you. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, um, just a point of correction, I will not be speaking from the IOC perspective, but rather from the value chain perspective, because the network code covers the entire gas value chain. The network code journey has been a long one. I recall that the inaugural OPTS gas subcommittee meeting on the network code held exactly 10 years and two weeks ago on the 15th of June, 2010. Some years later, NNPC fully backed by OPTS successfully handed over a draft code to the DPR who have then, who have now graciously and professionally coordinated its review and update to the present point. And it's now time for the entire industry to work together with speed and focus towards implementation. And yet being so close to the goalpost, we want to ensure that speed does not compromise operability. This network code must work. It must be successful, we must get it right. And that should be our mantra. The NGA cuts across the entire value chain. The network code operator, the gas users, the shippers, power plants, industries, LDCs, et cetera, and the gas suppliers. And it is therefore uniquely positioned to have a bird's eye view of the potential pitfalls and recommend ways to remedy this quickly and effectively. And so without much further ado, I will go into my topic for the day, which is um, to speak about the key industry concerns and operationalization gaps that require further review and alignment prior to the implementation of the network code. The first one I will speak about is the nomination limitations, section C. The power sector is the largest user of gas in the value chain. The network code provides a very unique opportunity to ensure that the dichotomy we see at the ministerial and regulatory level between the power sector and the gas sector is mitigated at the operational level. For example, transmission constraints have a significant and global impact on the ability of the operator to manage line pressure and on the ability of power shippers to take gas. It also affects suppliers because we experience back pressure whenever we have these transmission challenges. And so a key role of the operator should be to liaise with the national grid for power generation curtailment protocols, which will then be translated accurately into gas usage curtailments and transmitted in a fair and transparent way to affected shippers and suppliers. Still under nominations, we'll talk about the trade nominations. The Nigerian Gas Master Plan created sectoral pricing differentiation as a tool to develop those strategic industries for the purpose of overall economic development. Trade balancing is a very good attribute of the network code. However, it poses a conflict with sectoral pricing because it will necessarily lead to price arbitrage between the sectors. Trade balancing works best within the context of willing buyer, willing seller. We saw Peter, when he gave his presentation, talk about you know, the, the, how the balance trades on the U UK network code. That is a willing buyer, willing seller market. But where you have price regulation, you need to resolve the, the incoherence that um, trade balancing creates so that you can avoid um, um, issues of volume and price arbitrage, where an eligible shipper, for example, nominates its low priced gas with a view to divert it to higher priced industries. And we also want to avoid eclipsing the role of LDCs as distributors, noting that they continue to make significant contributions to gas penetration through marketing and development of lateral pipelines. Kolusha, uh, can you check your slides? They're not moving, please. Yes, actually I, okay. So, okay, there they are. So that's on um, um, trade balancing and the conflicts between um, that and the current price, um, sectoral pricing differentiation that we have in the industry. And then most importantly, um, the gas sales and aggregation agreements, for the most part, forbid trade nominations between shippers, specifically to forestall the concerns we, I highlighted before with um, regards to um, arbitrage between sectors. And this leads to an important point also, which is that concessions granted by the network code 
cannot override existing agreements and this should be made clear. The next thing I'll speak about is um, shrinkage gas. Uh, when we go to the section on shrinkage gas, we see that it appears to be arbitrarily determined. And um, this gives room for abuse to the detriment of shippers and other players in the, in the value chain. Um, there are well-known standards, global standards for the calculation of lost and unaccounted for gas, LAUF, and also the standards for what the maximum shrinkage gas, gas that should be allowable on the pipeline network. Um, is it 2%, is it 3%, 4%, there should be something fixed. It shouldn't be a moving target. And these should be clearly stated so that there's a transparent and objective measure that is fair to both shippers and the operator. And anything above the shrinkage cap would then be included in operational imbalances in favor of the shipper. Um, entry requirements. In this section, uh, we see that the operator is able to exit its obligations to the shipper after six months, particularly where it is in breach of its obligations under the code. And this is detrimental to the value chain, especially when we look at the fact that these shippers have long-term 10-year, 20-year um, obligations to buy and sell gas. And there are also long-term downstream agreements to deliver gas, power, or industrial products. And so generally, it is important that the network code, if it is indeed to successfully replace the GTAs, um, takes into cognizance the other agreements upstream and downstream of the gas value chain. One minute more. OK. So um, I have just um, a couple more points. Um, exit conditions. Um, generally, the roles and responsibilities of the operator in maintaining the line pressure needs to be more clearly defined. We should not be afraid of spelling these things out. We know we're on a journey, but then let us set appropriate targets and work together to meet them. So the operator um, here is able to unilaterally communicate a change in its delivery pressure commitments to shippers due to actions by external parties. Um, we need the operator roles as a prudent operator should be clearly defined. So if the operator requires licenses and um, regulatory approvals to build and use its pipeline facilities, then this obligation should be clearly stated. And then having obtained those approvals, it should be able to forestall third party actions that make it impossible for it to fulfill its obligations. And then generally, I'll just end with um, some general comments um, on credit rules. I note that there are credit rules for the, for the shipper, but none for the operator. And also there's no right of set up for the shipper. And this means that the shipper has little recourse if the operator is owing balancing payments, for example. So just as it's a section on shipper default, there should also be one that clearly spells out operator defaults and the remedies available to, to the shippers. And to summarize, I'll just say that closing these gaps, especially those related to more clearly defining the roles and responsibilities for the operator and ensuring back-to-back -back operability with the existing agreements in the industry will ensure the success of the network code and create a transparent and equitable environment for the Nigerian gas industry to thrive. Thank you. Well, good. Thank you very much, uh, Felicia. Again, another interesting uh, perspective from the details of the code and areas where we need to sort of tread carefully as we implement. Uh, you've talked about uh, the, the, the issues, operational issues that may arise around uh, nominations, um, the scope for uh, abuse in the form of uh, arbitrage uh, practices, um, which uh, if not properly managed, uh, can be an unintended consequence of the collusion between uh, the sectoral pricing and the trade balancing. Uh, you've also talked a lot about uh, direct operational issues with respect to the way the operator handles um, downstream challenges of pressure and co from the power sector and so on. Uh, and more importantly, just the general caution around uh, the, 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 the pace of implementation vis-a-vis -vis alignment to the existing operating practices uh, in existing GTAs. So I, I think these are all very interesting uh, perspectives which we, we have to capture. And I, I hope the DPR and NGCR are uh, taking notes of all these very critical 
areas of uh, uh, focus on the on the code as we we move towards implementation. Thank thank you very much for that. Um, our last uh, panelist is Dolapo Kukoi, and uh, I'd like to invite you to share your perspective. Uh, Dolapo, if you're there, six minutes. Yeah. Okay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you to the NGA for the opportunity. And this has been really, really insightful. Um, thank you to also the for the presentations. The presentations have actually really helped, you know, a lot to understand what's going on with respect to network code. Now, my my I'll be talking just from broad themes uh, about one the highlights for this network code. When I say highlights for me is what, what does it portend? What is the potential that it portends uh, for the industry? And then talking about the state of readiness. And in talking about the state of readiness, I'll be honing in on some issues. Uh, I think Mr. Odiase and Fulusho have done a great job in looking at the operational. So I'll be looking at from those two levels. One from the highlights. I think from a transactional perspective where, where I sit, the highlights for us for the code, you know, the potential for this code is that one, it then it provides a clear framework. It's supposed to at least supposed to provide a clear framework for how you know operation or pipe gas pipeline and transmission infrastructure will work going forward. And it also serves as a precedent. I said it because I've been involved in many negotiations where you are trying to, even, even though we've had different GTAs, different uh counterparties come with their different peculiarities but one of the things that you you have one of the advantages that you have with a framework like this is that it makes it quicker for transactions to close you already have precedent you already have a framework to which everyone can look and say this is the standard i found it very interesting what peter said that apart from the you know the main framework you know, for the network code, the independents also had their own code. And I think that we will probably get here. So, you know, independents have their own code and there's also the possibility for interconnections. What, what advantage having a code gives is that there's always a precedent that you can look to. There will always be specifics and there'll be peculiarities, but having, that, having a code in the market helps us set a precedent. And then from that precedent, we are able to deal with peculiarity. So I think that in terms of closing transactions, in terms of closing project, at least that part helps. And in terms of standardization, you know, for gas transportation, it would be very helpful. But then coming to the state of readiness and looking in on, you know, the Nigerian market. And it was very interesting to hear Peter also talk about the fact that, you know, uh, obviously the UK is a much more sophisticated market, you know, and the fact that we need to take some little steps before we take the big steps, you know, not daily balancing, monthly balancing, you need to be looking at that and all of that. So we will need to actually create something that works for us. In terms of the state of readiness, I think that one of the things that a, having a network code portends is that it must sit on a commercial framework that works. Um, we will have this framework all nice and dandy and will not be properly implemented if it doesn't sit on a commercial framework that, that is viable. And I think that there've been allusions to this when we talk about the power sector, for example. So one of the things that is clearly, clearly necessary for this to work will be extensive engagement. And I know that this has been talked about, this is something that ha will have to be very collaborative. It's not something in which, you know, um, the operator will stay in its silo and expect that everybody will toe the line. It has to actually be something that on the intergovernmental level is very, is very collaborative. And everybody, because I think Folusha alluded to that, that this is a value chain issue. So I'm a shipper, but at the end, at my exit point stands industries, power plants, and they all have to be aligned. The risks must back each other. So it's going to be very interesting to see how we're able to align. It's going to be very, very interesting to see how all the players in the value chain are going to be able to align to this. And it's going to take quite a bit of a transition period. We know where the power sector is. We know that it's, it's insolvent. We know that gas payments are still being 
um, subsidized at the moment. How do we get to a point where we have this framework and it works almost seamlessly? Those things have to, it has to be dealt with. Another thing, just talking from a transitionary period and our state of readiness, and I think it's been alluded to in questions, uh, is the transition period for GTAs, you know, to basically ease into, into going into everybody abiding to the network code. We, there, have been diff, there are different counterparties who have different specifics for their agreements and different specifics for their projects. It will take some time to align. Again, collaboration is needed. Engagement is needed to ensure that we transition as quickly as possible. And I think that one of the things that will be helpful, particularly for specifics of projects, which, are, which is helpful with the network code, are the agreements that, you know, the ancillary agreements, perhaps for specifics of some of the some of the specific parts of, of agreement or specific parts of projects, you could use those agreements to deal with those specific parts whilst the network code still stands at circle plan. But it's going to be very interesting to see. Something else that I think is very, very key and uh, we need to think, I think, I think Mr. Odiasi alluded to that is the role of the regulator. We, we will need to, and I, my assumption at this point is that our regulator is DPR. One minute now. We will need to have strong, okay, we need to have a strong regulator who will be able to enable, basically be an enabler for the environment. And also as we go along the way, there's a lot of standardization that needs to be done. We talk about metrics, we talk about nominations, we talk about, you know, different plants and different shippers and off-takers have, are in different states. Getting to the place where we um, transition and we get to at least an industry where people are to a certain um, to a certain state that are, are uniform or are able to comply is going to be a hurtling task. So the, the capacity of the regulator is very key. The role of the regulator in ensuring that this happens is very, very key. Um, I think I'll stop there so that I don't overshoot. Yes. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dolapo. I think you you actually helped us summarize the the, the key issues. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot for that. Um, I mean, uh, if if I sort of take your key points, basically, uh, is there is need to ensure that we have very extensive engagement during this transition uh, across all the issues from commercial uh, uh, to operations and so on. So. Uh, you also re-emphasize the point around uh, taking small steps before big steps. Um, uh, in particular, uh, a very key point you, you crystallize is the need to align the risks across the value chain uh, so that we don't uh, look at the network alone and uh, implement all sorts of things in the network code and then create a major distortion across the different ends of the value chain uh, uh, you know, misaligning the risk profile in the business. So we need to walk that. And um, you also talked about the role of the regulator uh, as an enabler of the process uh, going forward. So excellent, thank you very much. I think, um, I think we've had quite a, a, a good mix of uh, perspectives and uh, presentations. Uh, thank you very much to all the, uh, all the speakers and uh, presenters and panelists. I think in the next sort of uh, 20, 25 minutes, we'll, we'll sort of take uh, some questions. I know there's been, uh, there's a, the Q&A uh, you know, platform is uh, buzzing with a lot of uh, questions. Uh, clearly, we're not able to take all questions today. And I think the, um, the E has already mentioned that um, you know, this, is a, this is a process. Uh, we're gonna compile the questions and uh, as much as possible, try and get feedback. But I'd like to take um, uh, some of the questions uh, and, and um, get the perspectives of the speakers. Uh, this may be just sort of general type questions, you know. So um, first question I'd like us to very quickly discuss, it, this has come up very frequently, is um, the issues around the metering, how do you, how do you, how do you implement the network code without an effective metering system on the transmission network, on the offtake points? You know, do we have functional standard meters? How are these meters calibrated? Uh, basically, 
uh, and um, you know, related to meters, uh, also uh, chromatographs as well. How do you uh, deal with the issue of gas specifications and gas quality uh, coming in at the different entry points? So um, I like to start with uh, the NGC on that one, uh, if, if Mabel is there, and then, uh, and then uh, DPR, you know, to, to share their perspective. So uh, very quickly, Mabel, do you have any thoughts on, on, on this? And I, I think you talked about some of them already. Yes, thank you, sir. So uh, as we stated in the presentation, we have uh, meters at our off-take points. At the entry point, uh, we, you know, based on the contractual, I think the model for the industry, the cost of the transfer meter is usually with the supplier. And then there's joint calibration at those points to ensure that those meters are in good condition. The same provisions are also in the GTA for the exit points. They are meters, standard meters that are agreed on in the GTA contracts. And those are maintained now as a, an operational concern. Yes, there might be some aging and, and, and that's why we said we are going around, we are, we are putting more uh, infrastructure in place. We are replacing gas chromatographs where they need to be replaced. But what we need to state for sure is that we have meters currently being used commercially and you wouldn't have a shipper agreeing to volumes that it doesn't think are, are appropriate. So we do have metering. NGC is infrastructurally ready to go on this journey and we are improving our system every day, increasing capacity and bringing in more of this metering uh, metering facilities and uh, gas quality checks on our system. Those are my thoughts on that. All right, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Stephen, do you want to add uh, to that, particularly with respect to, uh, you know, the calibration of meters with respect to, uh, you know, gas quality, gas specifications that are going to be allowed by law or by regulation into the network? All right, uh, thank you, Dr. Ige. And uh, I think uh, Mabel uh, clearly spoke to some of the critical issues uh, that we've. So, the metering availability of confidence that is required uh, for effective transactions uh, around the uh, network code is very important. Uh, maybe just a point of information to then bring to uh, this uh, <clears throat> webinar is that the implementation team for the network code has established uh, more of on the ground working team that is then working at looking uh, at all the operational details that are required for the full op for the full operationalization of the network code. Uh, currently, there are two teams uh, constituted of DPR <coughs> and competent persons uh, from NGC that are working on the technical requirements for an effective takeoff of the network yesterday i hope i happen to be leading that team uh we have weekly meetings now to review how very well ready we are uh, for the go live date and our meeting yesterday clearly deliberated um, mainly on the metering readiness now for the regulators to are very critical for us available meters but then number two those meters need to operate at accuracy and reliability and reliability levels that will then promote the realization of the objectives of the code and then if you have taken time to go through the code you will find that the code has made clear definitions of minimum metering specifications that will then be used in operationalizing the code. Uh, 
specifications around metering uh, accuracy, uh, specifications around uh, operation and maintenance of the meters, which will then begin to give us a clear insight on how the reliabilities of those meters will be guaranteed, have been reasonably established by the code. And then generally, for metering operation around custody uh, activities, then has specifications that have been defined, which were done in line with industry best practice to ensure that uh, meters that are used for custody transfer, uh, custody transfer that will then lead uh, to fiscal purposes, that those meters are operated and maintained in a manner that will promote uh, such purposes. So progressively, uh, the DPR will continue to work with NGC and the industry uh, by greater extension to ensure that the clear uh, requirements that have been placed on the measurement around metering in the network code, that those requirements as a minimum will be fully realized. Thank you, sir. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Stephen. Um, David, can, um, I know you didn't pick on me. Can I give a quick answer to this question of metering as well, if I may? Okay. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, it's just that we did, we, I understand the, the issue and we came across this problem in Ukraine with the code there. The issue is what happens, how do you operate the network code when, when the metering is not sufficient, either not enough or bad quality? Um, now, there will be in Ukraine, in, we're in Ukraine and, uh, and, and, certain, and certainly in Nigeria as well, some places where the meters is of good quality, you know, less than half a percent in accuracy. Um, not all over, but at certain places you do have good metering um, information. So there you've got uh, certain basis places, physical places there that you have the good information. Um, at other places where there's no metering, you can have estimates. Um, and also there's a, there can be a system of attribution, which is an estimate based on each individual's customer's uh, past and expected performance. You can get fairly accurate estimates of, for individual customers. And then when metering does occur, you can then catch up later. The, the issue is to make sure that there are incentives on the owner of that meter, usually the uh, transport company, to make sure that over time they have the incentive to, um, to adjust. So that if there are inaccuracies between your estimate and later um, and the later meter, that that should not entirely be bought by the shipper if it, if it comes to them, that the transporter should have an incentive to increase the, uh, the level of metering over time. But using estimates, uh, attribution, using the secure meters you have, and where you have inaccurate meters, just you know, for a while you could just say, well, we know these meters are inaccurate, but this is the information we're going to use, and we're going to invoice on that basis. Well, thank you very much. That's really, uh, that's helpful uh, clarification. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, there, there are all sorts of uh, stakeholder groups here. So I'd like, as much as possible, I'd like to take questions from the different stakeholder groups. I've got a question here uh, that uh, this is from Justin of CIMC. It says, we're into... tube trailers and road tankers. I, I believe that's a, a simple one, but uh, uh, Steve, you want to answer whether this network code, does it affect LNG and CNG truckers? Uh, can you unmute us? All right, I didn't hear a bit of the questions, uh, but <clears throat> So like the presentation uh, clearly indicated the scope uh, of uh, the coverage of the network code regime uh, at the, in the first instance, uh, what you're going to find uh, the scope of this network covering, it's primarily for a start, uh, the gas transmission systems. So we will be looking at 
at uh, ensuring, <coughs> firstly, uh, that the gas transmission systems that are very critical uh, to a lot of the gas transportation activities that we have currently in the country, uh, that they are brought into the code and then supported through the objectives of the code to then begin to perform uh, at a dimension where we will begin to see impact uh, that are created in the market. Then push within probably 18 months, two years, to then begin to see how the network code can actually be expanded to then literally cover every segment of the market that needs to be governed by the clear rules of the code. So for the immediate takeoff, we are going to be covering only the gas transmission systems uh, that are being adequately prepared to ensure that we start up an Nigerian gas transportation network code that will really meet uh, the kind of values that we require in the domestic gas sector. Right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Steve, for that. So essentially, uh, for the CNG and LNG players, uh, the, the, the network code really uh, will not uh, will not apply in, 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 at the beginning. It, it would seem, yeah, uh, and for a while. Um, there, there's a question here, which maybe uh, Dalako uh, can uh, can talk to talks about. What, what is the legal effect of the of the network code, does it does it have a does it have a legal a legal standing? I know it's it's been implemented in the form of a regulation, but maybe you have a, a lawyer's perspective of, of that question. Um, I would call yes, yes, it is. It it is not from what I've seen. It's not on the basis of any law, but the powers of the, it's been based on the powers of the regulator issuing it. As currently drafted, it is not a law. It is a code of conduct, or I would say a set of rules as agreed by an operator. It's basically operator led because you would also see that the code doesn't uh, talk about regulators. It doesn't talk about a regulatory rule. It doesn't really, really talk about you know, refer to a regulator's role in it. So it's, to me, I would say it's a code or a set of rules that is being led by the operator. But then is the reason why I said that it's important that we know what the code, the, the um, role of the regulator will be in this, because the regulator does have a role to play with respect to standardization and what it is, you know, that we want to see from a legal perspective. But if you, if you put it that way, from a legal perspective, it is something that if you are going, it doesn't bind everybody, but to the extent that you are going to be using the, the um, network, then you, are, you will be bound. So if I put it, it's a code, it's a code of conduct for anyone who is within that framework. So it's not a, it's not a, it's not a law. It's not a law and it's not a regulation because it wasn't issued by a regulator. It's issued by an operator. So it's a code of conduct for everyone who is going to be using um, the, the, trans, the gas transmission or gas, gas transportation network. Okay. That's an uh, interesting position. So, so you say it's not a law, it's not a regulation, but it's essentially an instrument of the network operator. Yeah. Yes, uh, yes. Let me get um, let me get um, um, James to say something on that, and then I'd like to hear uh, DPR's perspective on that position as well. Yeah, uh, obviously the uh, like Dolakbo said is just a, a code of rules, and uh, more or less, even with uh, what I mentioned as regards the modification you know, is left to the operator. So it's more or less uh, a situation where the regulator has recognized that um, the, the pipeline system belongs to an operator and the operator uh, has defined the, the code with which, uh, under which everybody using 
the network will be subjected to. So it's really, you cannot point to it as a, uh, as a law or a, a, a regulation in the, in the uh, standard sense of it. And that's why uh, I've mentioned that uh, we need to think of how to bring other network systems and operators, you know, subject to, uh, to the code or incentivize them to uh, submit to a code of some sort. Thank you. Thank you, um, Stephen. Do you want to you want to say something on this? Uh, so thank you very much uh, for the insight. Uh, very <clears throat> so very insightful question. Uh, we also had to take this discussion uh, with our legal team in DPR. I'm just trying to get their response uh, from the email uh, to then give uh, further insight, uh, more of from the perspective uh, of the legal team in DPR. Now you're going to find that um, number one, the code was the code is being issued <clears throat> uh, on the premise of uh, powers that are granted <clears throat> to the honourable minister of the petroleum resources to then give directives to give steer to the optimal operation of the oil and gas industry in a manner where the industry will be expected <clears throat> to create the kind of value that is required. Now, if such powers uh, have then been put to use using extant uh, legislatives, uh, legislative powers that the Honorable Minister has, <clears throat> then you can clearly begin to agree with me that the basis upon which uh, the code has been developed and uh, issued to govern uh, the performance of the oil and gas sector in Nigeria is purely <clears throat> uh, supported at some point by clear legislative powers that has been put to use. The roles of the regulator is going to involve uh, implementing licensing regimes that will then govern the operation of every player <clears throat> in the network code. And then when those licensing regimes are uh, issued, you're going to find that those licensing regimes are going to also be issued on the premise of clear <clears throat> legislative uh, powers that, for example, the Department of Petroleum Resources have been issued to then uh, issue such licenses and then monitor the operation of those licenses in a manner where all the issues around the code will then be adequately administered. I will still try and get uh, the more focused, detailed response of our legal uh, position of our legal department, and probably just post it as a chat so that that can be read before this meeting ends. Okay, thank thank you very much. I think that that helps. Um, I've got one or two questions from the power sector here, and I'd like to uh, uh, direct this uh, basically to back again to you, um, uh, Stephen, and uh, probably it would be good to get uh, Felicia's perspective on them as well. Um, they, the first question says that uh, the use of the network code, this is from Stephen Ogaji of uh, NDP 18. Uh, the use of the network code requires signing up and paying for capacity. And the major gas users as power generators uh, do not have recognized capacity payments in the power industry for now. Do you think these generation companies can sign up on a misaligned framework? How do you advocate accommodating these categories of customers given uh, the sign on date is fast approaching? So essentially trying to say that on one hand, uh, you know, a, a major buyer like the power sector who has no recognition of capacity charges for his own Genco uh, is compelled by the operator uh, 
to pay. Actually, maybe maybe there's a question. Uh, uh, maybe I should answer actually, uh, rather than DPR. Uh, but then they have to deal with uh, capacity charge uh, from the operator. So that's the first question on for the past. The second question is um, DPR will be imposing licensing fees and other fees that are extraneous to power industry practice. As DPR align its expected fees with the power industry regulator NERC to ensure a seamless participation. So those are two questions from power sector. Mabel, you want to say something about the capacity charge um, uh, issue? And um, Felicia, do you have any, any, any perspective on, on those two points as well? And then Steve, of course. Yeah. Um, sorry, sir. Uh, I don't know if you could take, I, I was a bit distracted. I thought you were addressing okay. uh, uh, Steve. So maybe you could take the part on capacity charge. Okay, so, the, the, so the, the question on the, uh, from Power Guy is essentially that uh, the operator is going to be imposing a capacity charge for use of the transportation network, right? But the, the off-taker, the pass, the Genco, uh, the current commercial framework does not cater to capacity charges for them, right? So they, they think there's a misalignment and, and they're wondering how do you reconcile this to uh, misalignment, this, this misalignment rather. Okay, okay, thank you. So um, what I'll say about that, first of all, I think if we're also talking of alignment, the transporter in this case, in the power sector, will be the TCN, if I'm not mistaken. Not necessarily, I think the Genkos will be marrying their situation to the gas suppliers. I mean, if, if you get what I mean on the value chain. Uh, so talking about uh, a power generation plant, not having a capacity charge, I think it's like asking about the um, gas producers not having a capacity charge. So that also doesn't apply in the uh, gas value chain. And so for our own capacity charge, for this, I always uh, refer to, um, it, it's like a hotel building. We have capacity, we have rooms. Uh, on. I hope we've not run out of time. She's, uh, she's off. Okay. So I sorry, uh, sorry about that. I'm back. Sorry, sorry about that. So I, I was just saying, so on, on if you look at it in that uh, light, you you book the, the, the past sector, it's, it's unfortunate in a way that, you know, we can trace the past sector issue all the way to payments, but um, the, the the shipper or the bus, uh, the power sector in this case is in better light to know what capacity they need on the pipeline. There's a lot of investment. We talked about new projects. You talked about the ELPS looping. You know all the risks around that. You talk of the OV3. You know all the issues with the Niger crossing. Huge dollar investments. So you, you do all of this. You have uh, capacity on your line. Somebody just keeps a portion of it that is directly tied to investment costs and doesn't use it and wants to be charged just for the volumes. Now, I don't blame, like I said, we know all the issues in the past sector, but the, the, the operator cannot survive without um, some certainty in revenue, getting good return on his own investment. So I think that's what I would, I would say, and those are my thoughts about that. The capacity charge is necessary to keep the transporter's business going. We don't want to crumble the transporter's business. There's the AKK investment going on. It's all tied to that. So, so there are streams that have to be kept. Besides, the return for the transporter is not even much. It's a utility. Right. The industry recognizes that. So uh, those, those are just my thoughts on it, sir. Okay. No, very good. Thank you. Uh, I think this is going to be an interesting one um, going yeah. forward. We probably can't resolve it today, but clearly um, 
I think it's one that the implementers have to have a real look at uh, so that we don't, um, you know, so because the power sector is the most dominant um, off-taker of gas and is also going to be the most dominant uh, uh, subscriber to the transportation network. And so, you know, uh, is there any chance that we'll be setting ourselves up for some massive debts uh, in this structure again? So. Uh, interesting, interesting uh, issue there. Um, uh, I, we're terribly short on time, but I'd like to hear Fulusha's uh, uh, perspective on uh, on this, this this kind of issues. Um, thank you, Dr. Egi. So um, I think the question really is: As Nigerians, do we want to move towards the lowest, the least common denominator, or do we want to strive for excellence? The gas industry is making very positive strides, very moving, positive towards, strides. moving towards um, global standards in terms of the way the, the industry operates. And that includes um, paying capacity charges and um, in, inculcating discipline through the network code. The power industry also has to move forward. And um, it is, it is um, I understand the power, the, the power, the GENCOs when they say they, they, have to, they have to pay a fixed cost on one hand, whereas they have variable evacuation on the other hand, where the transmission company can arbitrarily just curtail them and they don't have um, capacity, they don't have um, rights, they don't have take or pay on the transmission side. But then the effort then should be to move the power sector forward to catch up with the, with, the, with the gas sector so that we can have that alignment. Um, the issues of um, coordination between the two ministries in licensing fees, in operations is, is a standing one that we have spoken about so many times and it does need to be done. Now, who is going to do it? Who is going to, to um, carry out that coordinating role? I do not know the answer to that, but it is certainly something that has to be done so that we can move forward. As Dr. Egan noted, the power sector is the biggest user of gas. So there is no way um, the gas industry, the network code can work without this coordination. Thank you. Right, thank you very much, uh, Felicia. Excellent. Um, I'll just take the, the last uh, two questions. Sorry, uh, sorry, Dr. Egan, can I, can, I, can I just speak to... <clears throat> yes, uh, yes. Okay. Right. So, so thank you again. Uh, very insightful discussions around uh, the critical linkage that needs uh, to be established uh, between uh, gas supply and uh, power generation. Uh, because of this criticality in the early stage of uh, industry stakeholder engagement, uh, that's as the regulator, we actually uh, clearly identified uh, the need to ensure that we create the capability to really begin to talk with the power sector on a much, much closer note, and then uh, reached out to Nigerian Electricity and Regulatory Commission uh, to then begin to engage, to have a clear understanding <clears throat> of a lot of the issues on the power sector end of the value chain, which then needs to begin to be looked at in a manner where we can then backwardly try to address those issues, to give the network code a fair chance uh, to then perform optimally. And I'm just glad to say <clears throat> that when we reached out to NERC, they apparently were also waiting for an opportunity like this. So we saw a very high level <clears throat> uh, participation in that meeting. We had uh, the executive vice chairman of NERC, uh, six of his commissioners, and a general manager who then really were engaged with DPR, <clears throat> clearly discussing a lot of the issues that are being raised up here, and then uh, giving recommendations on how we need to work together. That's why on my closing remarks, when I say is the market ready, uh, I said, yes, I think we are, because already we are then pushing for the required kind of intersectoral collaboration that we need across uh, the critical aspect of the gas value chain to ensure that issues are being constructively uh, pursued now in a manner where they will be closed uh, and then given the value to then have the network code to perform. So we are discussing very deeply 
to also then just give a point of information around wanting to make sure uh, that the market, particularly gas power, <clears throat> the gas to power value chain perform optimally. We have deepened our engagement as the regulators again uh, to then even begin to talk to the GENCOs specifically. We had an engagement uh, with the Association of Power Generating Companies of Nigeria. We are close to about uh, 45 participants from five, six major power generators uh, were in that meeting. The, some of the agreements, resolutions that we had in that meeting has been communicated officially to the Department of Petroleum Resources. We are taking all of those <clears throat> uh, issues that were raised through a mechanism that DPR and NGC it's then going, the two committees, technical, commercial, and legal, will then look at those issues very comprehensively and then ensure that issues that can be closed uh, before the go-live date, that uh, we're able to give enough <clears throat> energy to uh, try to close those issues before the go-live date. But issues that cannot be closed before the go-live date, then we're going to articulate them in a the manner where we'll just follow through the necessary processes that are required to ensure that we close those issues. On the uh, issue of the licensing fee, uh, what we have always uh, emphasized from the Department of Petroleum Resources, so the code uh, specifies and uh, makes a provision for license fees to be charged, but the premise that DPR is going about charging the license fee is to ensure that license fees that will be charged by DPR will be charged on an optimal cost benefit ratio. So what you will find the license fees of DPR doing is going to, we are working to then charge license fee that will create <clears throat> uh, value for every licensee in a manner where your license fee will actually clearly give you better business uh, performance indicators. When the license fees come, possibly at the bigger industry uh, wide stakeholder engagement, the license fee regimes will have been ready and then we'll be able to take uh, deeper discussions on that. Thank you. All right, very good, uh, thanks. Um, the time is, uh, um, is really against us, but I'll, I'll just um, take two key, that's uh, very quick uh, questions or points. The first one is an interesting one, uh, also directed to you, Stephen. Uh, it says, uh, when will the regulator exit this purely commercial structure, right? So I'll take that again. When will the regulator exit this purely commercial structure? I wouldn't mention his name so you don't withdraw his license, but you go yeah. Go ahead. As from Soji, I will buy it. <laughs> okay, no problem. Okay, I, uh, I hope I understand your question very well. But again, <clears throat> so if you follow the, uh, operational framework for the network code, you will understand uh, that the licenses of all operators within the regime of the network code, it's going to be done in a time frame that will have the regulator practically, practically always working in the network code regime to ensure that those licenses are always issued. Now, Apart from issuing the licenses, you're also going to find that some of the roles that have been clearly articulated for the regulator <clears throat> in the effective operationalization of the network code will then also require that the regulator at some point, even though <clears throat> not actively involved in uh, a lot of the commercial uh, uh, details that will then be happening in the operationalization of the network code, but there are clearly roles that have been articulated for the regulators that will then require that the regulator is always available to ensure that those roles are <clears throat> clearly achieved. Number one, license. Every year we have to come in and ensure uh, the licenses that were issued have performed optimally. Uh, number two, we need to then always be available to ensure that we are providing the kind of regulatory support uh, that the market requires to then continue to perform as is expected. Uh, and then a lot of some of the monitoring roles that the regulator is then supposed to bring to the effective operationalization of the code will always be with us. So I don't know if that answers your question precisely, but the regulator will always be with the network code. 
Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I think sadly for Mr. Awopari, you would always be there, uh, basically. Um, <laughs> but um, I think in closing, um, I'd like uh, every one of you to just in 30 seconds, just give your perspective on uh, open access. Uh, when, when do we move to open access downstream uh, of the major transmission line? How quickly uh, should we move to, how do we, how quickly do we effect open access in the other co uh, networks uh, in the, you know, uh, in the, in the country? Just, just a quick point, any, any, any perspective at all on the network, but let me start with Peter. Thank you. My, uh, I'm going to use my 30, use my 30 seconds, if I may, to um, say something about balancing. One of the, there were several questions which were addressed just to me, and one of them I'd like to pick up on. I said we have to be careful about the balancing regime, and the question was, was so what are my proposals? Um, quickly, I think the responsibility lies with shippers. Um, and there should be easy tolerances to start with. I think the code probably does have fairly easy tolerances. There need to be needs to be clarity on the operational balancing arrangements. That is, how is a shipper selected to, to fill in balancing um, the shortfalls? Clarity on curtailment. So this, this all needs to be agreed within the modifications committee. And the other thing I wanted to pick up, and it was related to the earlier first question about metering is to do with um, shrinkage or gas for own use. So the operator will be required to obtain gas to make up imbalances. Now those imbalances are for operators own use and also for losses and these include metering losses and for theft. So and, and it is possible to work out what volumes of gas belong to each of those areas. So if the operator is calling for a lot of, um, of uh, shrinkage gas, then everybody can see very clearly that there's a problem. And then, so then they can home into what the problem is, whether it's meters or theft or something else. Uh, the other point I wanted to say is that it's recommended to have an independent operator, although the transporter is in charge of operating this process, NGC, but it's common in many countries to have an independent company under their jurisdiction, but someone who is expert in operating the network code to actually manage all of this. Um, doesn't quite answer your question, but that was a point I wanted to make. Thank you. All right, no, thank you very much. That was quite helpful. Um, okay, um, can uh, Felicia, your closing points, uh, open access and any other th um, thanks, Dr. Ege. Um, Peter raised a very interesting point, which is about having an independent operator, which is actually quite interesting because when we look at the pipeline owner as the operator, we see that in the GTAs, the pipeline owner is a counterparty to the, to the shippers in a balanced agreement, whereas the network code, they, we see a struggle there between being a regulatory document and an agreement. It's, uh, it's tried, I can see the migration between when we started from it being a document that basically dictated how things should be on the network um, unilaterally from um, an operator to a shipper to one that is now trying to merge into um, trying to combine that with the attributes of an agreement between two equal parties. And it hasn't quite achieved that yet. So um, Peter's comment about having an independent operator may actually be something that um, the industry may also want to consider. It may be something that may help to resolve that, um, that struggle between regulation and agreement and um, the balancing of obligations and rights between the parties. Thank you. Very good, thank you. Um, Mabel? Any closing perspectives? Uh, yeah. So, um, I think I was just right first on what uh, the last speaker, uh, Felicia, just spoke about. Uh, so I think to address that issue, that's why the regulator has come in. 
So the regulator should play the role, as we said, of the umpire. And then you 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 had spoken to when will be the right right time uh, for for open access to be deployed in the distribution network. So I would say my own thoughts on that will be well now we're working with the uh, main trunk lines that have been doing this for a while now, even when NGC was not unbundled, we were still doing transportation for some uh, sh shippers, companies then. So I will say, well, I think we can take the lessons learned. Uh, the regulator is there now to take note of what is happening. And I think as things evolve, naturally with the merits that will come out from the operation of the network code, then we can start putting timelines to when it can be extended. Those are my thoughts on it. And um, I would just quickly also want to recognize the presence of my GM. She's with us now, uh, Mrs. Mary Rose Richard Oboha. I don't know if she want to say hello. You know, I stated earlier that she was unavoidably absent. So she has joined up. So she may want to say a word or two. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Mary Rose, uh, Mabel. And uh, welcome, uh, Mary Rose, if you're there. It's good to see you again. Good. Uh, Mary, do you, do you have uh, do you have any any comments or so? Um, Mary Rose, do you have any any comments? Does it? Okay, we'll come back to Mary then. Uh, looks like she's not she's not. Uh, hello, hello, hello. Okay, hi. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Yeah, yes. good afternoon, everybody. Uh, right. Let me just apologize for coming in late. I was really tied up in a, another meeting that I just couldn't leave. I tried to leave at some point, but it just wasn't possible. So I'm, I'm just sorry about that. Thank you so much. It's unfortunate I couldn't be at the, at the beginning of the whole thing, but uh, I know that I was well represented by my colleagues. Uh, you had uh, a fruitful and inciting uh, discussion. Thank you so much. All right. Well, thank you very much, Mary Rose. Clearly, Mabel, Mabel did an excellent job on behalf of you and NGC. And um, I guess she'll communicate a lot of the interesting perspectives for the NGC as well. Thank you. Um, James, uh, any closing thoughts? Yeah, I, I say that uh, the release of the network course I'm uh, uh, a big step in uh, liberalizing the, the market. But then I will uh, emphasize that, you know, we still have, um, just because of the lack of liberalization of the market, we have stranded volumes. And therefore, uh, to your question, I'll say, this open access extension to other networks has to be as soon as possible. I know it, it may it will be good to have learnings from uh, the uh, from what we have now with NGC, but I think uh, in the overall context of what is intended with respect to the uh, to the ne network code and open access, you know, going with NGC does not really move the dial much because NGC's uh, network has always been been open and uh, more or less uh, uh, liberalized. You just need to meet their commercial terms to come in. But you know, in many uh, areas of uh, the the gas market, there are stranded volumes that cannot get to the market and how the regulator goes about incentivizing uh, parties to subject themselves to the open access regime is key because it is a very touchy uh, uh, situation, particularly with respect to competition. You know, you, the, the majors have that problem. You know the story of the OGGS, uh, why it is 20% uh, full today. So we now have uh, NOPL, 
NOPF is if there's nothing done with respect to open access, NOPL will be just like OGGS. You know, a big pipeline system, much money invested, and uh, you know, very little throughput and delivery uh, suboptimal value to our Commonwealth. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, James. Thanks, Exxon. Um, I think um, Dalako as well. Thank you, Dr. Ege. Um, so do, when should we be giving open access? I still remain of the view that we need to take little steps here. I think a number of issues have been thrown up. And I think it's, it was a wise decision to start with probably the ELPS and you know, the, the open Adelkuta lines because it helps you basically be able to at least pilot those ones, see the issues, and then we can then expand. So I think we have to we have to first test this out, and it's very interesting a lot of what has come out of this. For example, issues that we are talking about about you know what legal basis does this code have? Yeah, and and there's been a very engaging conversation in the chat groups. If some of you have been seeing it, um, you know, amongst my colleagues, lawyers, people are of different views. Some people think that you know it needs to have a legal basis, otherwise it can't be enforced. Um, so it is interesting. There's also the issue about an independent operator, which from the moment I saw this code, I just really wondered why we have an operator who owns assets also being the operator in the agreement. You know, um, it, it only makes sense that we have an independent operator. So there, there are probably going to be things and teething issues, obviously. We are going to be in a transition to be able to implement even the first part of this. So I think let's give it some time to implement first and see how it works before we then expand. I think that would be the wise thing to do. It's how we do this that is important. On the, on the legal basis, there are two schools of thought. Should we have, should it, should it have it? Because right now, really looking at it, you can only deduce that the powers of the minister have you know, delegated to the, to the NGC to do this, but this is, not a, this is not a law and it's not a regulation. However, would the regulation ensure that this is implementable? I'm not quite sure. I think that people in an industry can agree on rules on something. And I'm not saying that there's no role for a regulator and there's no role for regulation here. There is a clear rule. And I think I've said that a lot for regulation, but I think that you can also have an industry in which people can agree on a set of rules and conduct, particularly if you have an independent operator and you can operate an industry. So um, I guess that the dialogue and the engagement continues. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, I mean, Well, it's always a challenge when you close this kind of uh, discussion with the uh, lawyers, but um, you know, we we have quite a lot of interesting perspectives here now. I mean, I, some things even when I started this uh, discussion, I never realized we will end up with. You know, so we're probably uh, we, this tells us there's a lot to do. Well. Um, our time is far gone. I, I, I would uh, like to thank all the participants, the speakers, the panelists uh, for such a, an exciting uh, uh, time. I think fundamentally, we, we all can see where the network code is leading us. It, it, it aims to take us towards uh, a fully competitive gas market, uh, an efficient uh, network uh, that helps to deliver uh, gas uh, uh, reliably to the off-takers and um, a framework that hopefully uh, should support investment in the, the network infrastructure among others and uh, enable discipline of participants in the network uh, uh, during operation. So there's a lot of good sides to it, uh, but we've also seen the complications of implementation uh, ranging from the legal effects, uh, the enforceability of the, the code uh, to uh, how do you manage the transitions? How do you deal with uh, potential abuse and exposure to arbitrage? Uh, how do you deal with uh, um, managing and cascading costs across the value chain, misalignment and things like capacity charge on one side and on the other side? How do we make sure that all those combinations of uh, fees, charges, liabilities, penalties do not in themselves uh, move the gas sector from, you know, semi-steady state uh, performance to uh, pretty much the semi comatose situation in the power sector. So quite frankly, um, 
it's very promising future, but there is a whole lot of work to be done uh, for us to implement it correctly. And I, I believe that uh, all the stakeholders and the NGA will take on board some of these points today and, uh, and help drive the implementation. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, at this point, I'll hand over back to the ES. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. David Ige, for moderating such a wonderful session and uh, being able to navigate through quite a lot of issues. Uh, at this point, moving quickly along, I would like to invite the president of the Nigerian Gas Association, Mrs. Audrey Joyce, to make her closing remarks. Madam President. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, again, thank you all for being part of this webinar. I want to first of all say that I believe we have done justice to the theme of today's webinar, which is that we're looking at the National Gas Transportation Network code, specifically from the point of view of the highlights, the potential cha challenges and the domestic market readiness. It seems to me that we have, we have dealt well with the highlights. We seem to agree among operators and regulators that in terms of market readiness, that is a plus. What comes then to the fore is the challenges, because for us, it's now about it, making it operational and successfully so. So when Mr. Yuba was speaking, he said, and he kind of put it in three buckets. He talked about the operationalization, then he talked about the optimization, and then of course the consolidation that takes us to that place of a fully mature gas market, uh, domestic gas market. And looking at all the things that have been put forward as potential challenges to operationalizing the code. One thing that stands out as being clear is that even as we have an August 10th line of sight in terms of going live, there is still a lot of work that needs to be done. The language is going to remain collaboration, extensive engagement, and I dare say the willingness of both parties to adjust. What it means is that on the side of the government and the regulators, we will not be so fixated on the fact that there is a code that we will not stare clear articulated industry operational challenges in the face and be willing to make adjustments. And of course, certainly on the side of the industry that we ourselves will be willing to shift to make sure that this is a success because collectively we all agree that this is in the best interest for Nigeria's gas industry. Now, one of the points that um, I believe it was Dolapo who made this among the very vibrant, very cogent um, and very real challenges that were mentioned is the fact that this code is supposed to operate within what is a viable commercial framework. And then this for me also then brings to the fore the many, many challenges that NGA continues to advocate about in terms of how we can improve the commercial landscape of doing business in our gas industry. So we hold ourselves as still being available as partners in this conversation to engage with industry and regulators to see how we address many of these things. Even I recall that when I believe it was Mabel who was speaking to challenges, she actually highlighted issues of contractual sanctity. And I think that's been spoken about by quite a few players. What am I saying in essence? Today for me has been a very fulfilling outing in the, in the sense that it has given a broader um, sense of understanding to players and to listeners as to what the code portends and what the real issues on ground are. Going forward, there is work to be done. Therefore, in the optimization stage, this is where collectively we should have dealt with some of the systemic um, challenges or, or, and done any adjustments necessary to then see this code fully rolling out successfully, so taking us to um, the mature market we're looking for. So I want to say a very big thank you again to all my panelists, absolutely fabulous submissions. Thank you for being very engaged um, in this whole discourse. Thank you for preparing even at what was a bit of a short notice. And I want to thank as many of the participants as are listening because I have seen very vibrant um, chats going back and forth. We have over 77 questions within this um, webinar and we had at least another 60 something even before that, showing that this is really very topical and participants are engaged. I appreciate that a lot. Uh, we will continue to come back. In fact, I believe that post this event, the executive secretary and his team, they will curate some of the outstanding questions and we're going to share them with the panelists and see those that will be willing to you know, put a few answers together, which we can then circulate again to all the participants today. So my thanks again to you, ES and the secretariat team. 
And I have to then reserve my final thanks for Dr. Ige. Thank you for excellent moderation. Thank you for always calling on, uh, being ready to respond when NGA calls. And that said, uh, thank you all for staying up to the end of this webinar. It's been a very enlightening session. And on behalf of the Executive Council of the Nigerian Gas Association, thank you once again. And we look forward to engaging with you in, in some of our future webinars. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you, Madam President, for that wrap up. And uh, I'd like to thank again the panelists and the distinguished ladies and gentlemen who have stayed with us to this time. Just before we go, we would like to share a bit of information with you about the NGA. So I'm just going to quickly uh, share my screen. So the Nigerian Gas Association is the apex nonpartisan organization representing the very and numerous stakeholders within the Nigerian gas industry value chain. It was established in 1999, and NGA is the largest gas focus for of tier member organization, the Umbrella Association and Voice of Gas in Nigeria. Our four cardinal values are advocacy, investment promotion, promotion of standards and best practices, and being the industry resource center of choice. Our membership comprises international and indigenous oil and gas companies, as well as a variety of other corporate and individual corporate entities and individuals with operations that encompass activities along the gas, the vast gas value chain from upstream, midstream, and downstream. Membership is open to both individuals and corporate entities with business interests in the chain. Some of our activities include advocacy, which this event is one of, you know, it's, it's an example of advocacy. Uh, and this is a continuous theme with the NGA and interventions to shape legislation and policy direction. We have our flagship event, which is the NGA International Conference and Exhibition, which is held every two years or biennially. We have annual business fora, which inter interrogate topical issues. We have study groups, four of them, to promote technical, regulatory, and contractual best practices for the industry. Um, and we have our learning solutions, which is a, a capacity building initiative for the industry, which holds frequent training events. And then of course we have regular workshops, roundtables, and uh, uh, other events to converge stakeholders in critical sectors of the gas value chain. We would like to invite you, if you are not already a member of the NGA, to join the association. Uh, the information on joining is in the chat and we can share that with you uh, after the event. And for more information on our a membership process and activities. The website is www.nigeriangasassociation.org.ng or you can send me an email. That information is on the screen. So um, having said all that, I would like to thank once again the panel, pan, pan, the, the panel for um, really doing justice to the theme. And on the issue of questions and presentations, I've seen quite a lot of uh, uh, information on the chat box uh, asking about the questions like, the president said the secretariat will actually curate and compile those questions, get the uh, answers from some of the panelists, and this will be sent out in a report to all attendees shortly, as well as presentations. All the presentations that were made by some of the speakers and panelists will also be aggregated and sent out to uh, attendees in due course. Once again, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, thank you for participating in this webinar. We look forward to hosting you at future NGA events soon. Goodbye and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank, Thank you, you so Thank much. You much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ege. Bye. Thank you, President. Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank much. You very much, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank Peter. you, Dr. Ige. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. That was an awesome. Uh, Thank you very thank you. much. Thank you. Yes, thanks for coordinating. Very well done. <laughs> thank you, God James. Oh, yes, yes. Well done. Excellent job. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.